Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is time for us to start. We have an awful lot to do today, and I uh, thank ladies and gentlemen. We have a quorum, and I would like to call to order the 29th meeting of the Executive Committee. And I want to uh, welcome, of course, all the members of the committee and the members of council and members of the public and the media who are here to join uh, in our proceedings today. And to begin our meeting uh, by acknowledging that we're meeting today on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and home to many diverse Indigenous peoples. Uh, you can watch us on YouTube at Toronto City Council Live or follow the meeting on your computer, tablet or smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. Uh, may I ask first if there are any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act and if you have uh, such a declaration to make, please indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. I see none, so we can move forward. Uh, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes of the Executive Committee meeting of October 24th, 2017? Councillor McMahon, Councillor Palacio, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as everybody will be aware, uh, we have a lengthy agenda in front of us today. We have many members of the community here who wish to speak, um, and I want to make sure that in order to cover off both the lengthy agenda and the people we have here to speak, uh, that um, I would propose uh, a motion in respect of how we uh, conduct this meeting, uh, and I would ask the clerk if she'll put the uh, motion up. Uh, it will close uh, registration, as you can see, at 10.30 this morning, and uh, no other registration would be allowed after that. The length of public presentations, speakers, members of council, members of the executive committee be limited to three minutes uh, with one round of questions. The questions to staff members from members of council, including the executive committee, be limited to three minutes, one round per member, and the speaking times for members of council be uh, three minutes. I think this will be lots of time uh, for us to get through all the business that we have to do, but also hear from everybody uh, who uh, needs to be heard from and wants to be heard from uh, in respect of uh, all the matters in front of us. Um, I, it, may I uh, have a... Uh, I, I'm moving that those changes for the procedure for this meeting be made. Uh, may I ask, uh, call the question, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Um, I'm also going to recommend some changes just in terms of how we... Uh, how we uh, deal with some of these items and, and the order of the agenda, and it's out of consideration for various requests that I've received um, as chair. And so I'll start with a recommendation that we will consider uh, items EX 29.2, Rail Deck Park, uh, EX 29.3, Parkland Strategy, and EX 29.4, a review of the city's alternative parkland dedication rate together, uh, and we will receive one uh, presentation, initially a brief presentation from the staff uh, on that. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, I would seek your concurrence. Uh, following lunch today, uh, we had um, a request from Andrea Christjohn from the Toronto Council Fire uh, to lead us in a blessing prior to our consideration of the, uh, of the uh, item EX 29.36, the establishment of an Indigenous Affairs Office at the City of Toronto. And it's proposed that we would have uh, the blessing, a smudging and drumming ceremony, and then proceed immediately to consider right after lunch uh, the establishment of the Indigenous Affairs Office for the City of Toronto as the first item of business after lunch. Then. Uh, I'm proposing that we consider uh, item EX 29.10, Enhanced Security Measures at Toronto City Hall, as the second item of business after lunch. It's likely that we're going to have to have a confidential uh, discussion, in-camera discussion there because of the reports uh, submitted to us. And then uh, two more. Uh, first of all, item 29.11, which is the, anti, the action plan to confront anti-black racism. Uh, and then 29.12, uh, the, uh, the poverty reduction strategy for 2017 uh, and, and the work plan for 2018. And all of this is out of consideration for various people who are here to be heard um, and, uh, uh, and experiences previously considered uh, because uh, some of these groups had to wait until 11.30, one of the last times we considered their matter and we just thought we would try to avoid that happening a second time in a row. 
Uh, finally, uh, I would propose that we break at 12.20 p.m. as opposed to 12.30, um, so that hopefully members of the uh, committee and uh, members of the public who wish to do so can attend the uh, celebration outside for the uh, Great Cup champion Toronto Argonauts. That begins at 12.30, and I know that a number of people here will want to attend, including the chair. So, uh, are people agreeable to those, uh, to those changes in the agenda? And if so, we'll proceed on that basis. So, uh, that then brings us to um, the rundown of the agenda. And of course, as you know, uh, if you want to hold an item, um, state your name and say hold. And the uh, items with deputants, I will hold uh, these items. And starting with uh, item EX29.1, Smart Track Project Update, it is being held uh, for uh, deputations. Uh, EX29.2, a rail deck park being considered with the other two is being held uh, for, uh, uh, for deputations. And so that means we're holding, since they're being heard together, 29.2, 29.3, and 29.4. Uh, that would take us to 29.5. Citywide real estate amendments to the municipal code chapters and shareholder directions. I'll move it. Held, uh, are you moving the recommendation? Were, were you wanting, were you moving the staff recommendations to yes. Councillor Shiner? All right, all those in favor? Yes. Opposed, carry. Thank you. 29.6, new City of Toronto investment policy being held for deputations. 29.7, development of low carbon uh, thermal energy networks, uh, and uh, the, the recommendations in the report are in front of you. I'll move those recommendations. Moved by Councillor Shiner. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carry. 29.8, uh, finalizing the consolidation of the Civic Theatres in Toronto. Uh, Councillor Crawford moves the staff recommendations. All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. 29.9, uh, um, I am proposing, uh, members of the committee, that we uh, we withdraw the item, that the item be withdrawn. Uh, the report uh, from Toronto Hydro, um, there's, uh, there is now a report, um, uh, and, but I guess there's been some discussion about the circumstances in which it makes its way to this committee. And so um, I'm just suggesting we just put it over. In other words, we withdraw it for now and it'll come back because there is a report. That, that's the good news, I guess. To where, Mayor Tory? Pardon me? To the next meeting of executive? I hadn't really thought about that because of the fact there's some discussion going on about the, 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 how this report gets handled, but um, I, I would say well, yes. I would move it if you will. Why? But the question is, why isn't the report here? Be because I guess the circumstances in which it is, is to be transmitted are under some discussion. I can only say that. So then la lawyers? It, lawyers. I am a lawyer, but I could be critical of lawyers from time to time. Um, and uh, Could I hold it down and then we'll look at where to move it to after? Yes, okay, that's no problem. Uh, item 29.10, uh, security measures, enhanced security measures at City Hall is being held down for uh, deputations. Item 29.11, uh, Toronto Action Plan to Confront Anti-Black Racism being held for deputations. 29.12, uh, Poverty Reduction Strategy and Work Plan being held down for deputations. 29.13, uh, Creating uh, Transitional Housing at 9 Huntley Street. Uh, Councillor Bylaw, moving the staff recommendations. Uh, moving the staff recommendations, Councillor Bylaw. All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. Uh, 29.14. Uh, was I right? Did that was 14? Yes, 14. Uh, finalizing plans for new supportive homes at 13 to 15 and 17 to 19 Winchester Street. Uh, Councillor Bylaw again, moving the staff recommendations. All those in favour? Opposed? Carry. Uh, 29.15, new supports and housing for survivors of human trafficking. I'd like to uh, hold that. Councillor Ainsley uh, moving hold. the. Pardon hold. me, we want to hold it. All right, held by Councillor Ainsley. 29.15. 29.16 and 16A, uh, funding allocations to support 57 affordable housing ownership uh, ownership homes. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the staff recommendations. Mayor, you want to hold that? You're still holding, just I'd like to have a recorded vote on this one. You, you, want, you don't want to hold vote. it, but you want to have a recorded vote now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Councillor Bylaw is moving the staff recommendations for 29.16, and there's been a recorded vote requested. All those in favour? Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bylaw, Councillor Burnside, Councillor Crawford, Councillor McMahon, Ma Mayor Tory, uh, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Shiner. All those opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 29.17, creation of, an, of a new property tax class for creative co-location facilities. 
Uh, again, uh, do we have a motion to adopt the staff recommendations moved by Councillor McMahon? Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. 29.18, the 2018 rate supported budgets, Toronto Water and Toronto Wastewater Consumption Rates and Service Fees. Uh, may I have a motion to adopt the staff recommendations uh, moved by Councillor Ainsley, uh, Councillor Crawford, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Count, uh, item uh, 29. Point 19, the 2018 rate supported budgets for solid waste management services and recommended 2018 solid waste rates and fees. Uh, the recommendations from the Budget Committee moved by Councillor, uh, I beg your pardon? I would like to hold that. You'd like to hold 29.19, held by Councillor Shiner. 29.20, um, the rate supported budgets for 2018 for the Toronto Parking Authority. I'd like to hold moved, that, please. You want to hold that? Held by Councillor uh, Ainsley. Thank you. 29.21. The 2018 interim estimates. Uh, motion to uh, approve the staff recommendations. Moved by Councillor Crawford. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. 29.22. Property taxes 2018 interim levy bylaw. Moved by, uh, on the recommendations of the, of the uh, report. Moved by uh, Councillor Crawford. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. 29.23, administrative amendments to the reserve fund accounts for 2017. Uh, and this is a report from the acting chief financial officer, moved by Councillor Crawford. The staff recommendations, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. 29.24, a capital variance report for the nine month period ended September 30th, 2017. A move by Councillor Crawford uh, that the uh, recommendations to be approved from the budget committee, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. 29.25, the operating variance report for the nine month period ended September 30th, 2017. Uh, coming from the Budget Committee, a motion to adopt the recommendation. Mayor, to the Tory, I'd Committee. like to hold that. I had some questions of staff. I'll do all. Councillor Shiner will hold 29.25. 29.26, the reserves and reserve funds variance report for September 30th, 2017. Uh, motion from Councillor Crawford to adopt the recommendations from the Budget Committee. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. 29.27, uh, budget impacts of the new minimum wage policy and other proposed Bill 148 changes. Uh, motion to be received. A, a motion to be received. Moved by Councillor Crawford. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. 29.28, uh, the transfer of funds from construction hoarding sign fee reserve fund XR 1219 and allocation to the Toronto Arts Council for 2017 Arts in the Parks. Uh, motion coming from the Budget Committee, moved by Councillor Crawford. All those in favour of approving the recommendation, opposed, carried. 29, uh, 29, 29.29, facilities, 2017 capital budget and 2018-2026 capital plan adjustments and accelerations deferrals, November. Uh, mo uh, recommendations coming from the Budget Committee, moved by Councillor Crawford. All those in favour, opposed, carried. 29.30. Fleet Services Division 2017 Capital Budget and 2018 to 26 to 2026 Capital Plan Adjustments and Accelerations Deferrals. Uh, recommendations coming from the Budget Committee. Move hold. by hold for uh, Councillor Ainsley. 29.31 Street Event User Fees for Business Improvement Areas. Again, coming from the Budget Committee. The uh, recommendations of the Budget Committee moved here by Councillor Crawford. All those in favour? 29.31. Held by Councillor Palacio. 29.32, uh, uh, Transportation Services 2017 Capital Budget Adjustments. Uh, Councillor Crawford is moving the recommendations coming from the Budget Committee. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carry. Uh, 29.33, Sorry, Arena Mr. Board. Mr. Mayor. Sorry. Yeah. I wanted to hold number 32. Uh, Councillor Ainsley wants to hold 29.32. Uh, 29.33, uh, the Arena Boards of Management 2016 Operating Surpluses Deficits uh, Settlement. Uh, motion coming from the Budget Committee to adopt their recommendations uh, from Councillor Crawford. Sorry. You want to hold that, uh, Councillor? No, but I just could, could we correct Red Reeve to Ted Reeve for my arena? Sure, he didn't have a nickname of Red? He uh, may have. <laughs> not that we know of after all this time. <laughs> that, that correction, I'm sure, Thanks. will be made in the uh, documentation. Uh, on the item, uh, the question to be called 29.33. Uh, Accepting the recommendations of the Budget Committee. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. Uh, 29.34, Sony Centre for the Performing Arts, reallocation of 2017 State of Good Repair Capital Funds. 
Uh, motion coming from the Budget Committee, moved by Councillor Crawford. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. 29.35, Toronto Transit Commission 2017 Operating Budget Adjustment. A recommendation coming from the Budget Committee, moved by Councillor Crawford. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. 29.36, uh, the um, uh, establishment of an Indigenous Affairs Office at the City of Toronto is being held for a presentation, uh, as discussed earlier. 29.37, Executive Management Indigenous Cultural Competency Training. Uh, there's a motion coming from the Aboriginal Affairs Committee, uh, moved by Councillor McMahon. Uh, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried. 29.38, Festivals and Events Requiring Program Criteria to Incorporate Accessibility Requirements. This is a recommendation coming from the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, and is there someone to move the staff recommendations? Moved by Councillor Ainsley. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. 29.39. Engaging the community of people with disabilities in the public appointments process at the City of Toronto. Recommendation coming from the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. May I have a mover for the recommendation coming from that committee? No, a move. Oh. It's not noted on my copy of the agenda, but let's have a look at the updated list here. Miguel, oh there, oh, yeah. Miguel, you're absolutely right, and it is your name, so I apologize for that. Uh, yes, you're listed there too. Yes, we just we're having a presentation and deputations on that. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're holding 29.39 for a deputation. 29.40, fire prevention in high-rise buildings. Uh, that has come forward as a recommendation from the Tenant Issues Committee. Um, may I have a mover for that? You're moving that. You have, oh, sure, Councillor Crawford. I just want to, uh, uh, supporting that, but just moving it to the budget process, I believe, uh, referring to the budget process for uh, consideration. So the motion that the, the, re the recommendation says direct that funds be included in your uh, substitute. What, what I'm saying is. is and, and that it be referred to the budget. Yeah, to be referred to the process budget for process. consideration. Clerk has a, a motion. Okay, there it is. To refer the item to the budget committee. All right, Councillor Crawford has moved the executive committee refer this item to the budget committee for their consideration. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Uh, the 29.41 item, status of suite metering in rental buildings in Toronto is being held for a deputation. 29.42, uh, the hate-sponsored rallies such as al Quds Day um, is being held for deputations. And finally, uh, item 29.43, municipal property taxation for railway rights-of-way. Um, this uh, is coming from uh, a letter that I guess was written by Councillor Ainsley. Um, so we, 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 I, you, I assume, move the recommendations contained in your own letter? Yes, please. Um, are there are they, all those in favor? Opposed? Carry. All right. So thank you for that. Uh, that then brings us to um, item 29.1. Uh, and uh, we have the deputations. If I can just find my green sheet somewhere here. There it is. I see it. And uh, the first person to be heard today uh, on the Smart Track item 29.1 is Raymond Shen. Mr. Shen, good morning. Uh, and pursuant to what you heard us discussing, you have three minutes. Uh, and so we welcome your comments. Starting now. Good morning. I support the concept of Smart Track. All right, Mr. Shen, uh, I'll stop the clock here. Um, there's the usual buzz that seems to arise right after we finish doing this and people are shuffling about. We'll just give 30 seconds for people to settle so we can hear you because uh, I want to hear your comments. Over here, uh, there's a lot of shuffling and conversation going on. If we could... I, I don't know what's going on back there, but if, whatever it is, if we could take it outside or have people sit down, that would be super. Same over here. Okay, Mr. Shen, uh, I'll start the clock again. Thank you very much for being here. I support the concept of Smart Track and wish to tell the mayor there are no objections to using the Metrolink corridors for rapid transit. His error is to implement Smart Track using GO equipment and anti antiquated railroad technology. The proper solution is EMUs using, using modern signaling systems, regrettably incompatible with GO. It requires new tracks in the Stovall corridor repurposing the UPX tracks and bypassing Union Station. The smart track can be funded by cancelling the Scarborough subway extension. GO is not the right equipment for smart track. 
GO is a commuter service. It uses bi-level railroad coach cars to load large numbers of people. Railroad regulations require 15 minute separation between trains. This, there's been no discussion of smart track ridership because 15 minute service has no appeal. Union Station is a major bottleneck to the GO system. Daniela Magisano told me the mayor is aware of these items. Smart track is a hub and spoke city service. TTC buses deliver batches of passengers to a station. Trains continually sweep stations to keep up with the stream of buses. This requires tracks with modern signalization, trains with faster acceleration and more doors, and station with raised platforms. EMUs are like subway trains and are more appropriate for SmartTrack. They can run in the Metrolinx corridors, but to provide four minute train service, they need a separate track system. Two tracks will be added to the Stouffville corridor, the terminals at Finch with stations at Ellesmere, Lawrence and Kennedy. There is no need to add extra tracks in the West Corridor. The UPX line could be repurposed to serve smart tracks. The existing UPX stations would need to be modified and more stations added. To avoid Union Station, smart track along the Lakeshore line leaves the Lakeshore Corridor at Eastern Avenue and travels under, on, or elevated above King Street to connect to the UPX line. Major funding comes from canceling the Scarborough Subway Extension, the SSE. In return for building the SSE, Council acquiesced to the offer of 5,000 new residential units at the Scarborough Town Center. The SSE is an economic plan 30 years into the future. Smart plat track is a transit plan needed for today. As a transit priority, Council should cancel the SSE and fund smart track with proper equipment. Uh, I have some Thank time you, left. Mr. I just want to re reiterate, uh, smart track is a great concept. It's, it's flawed by using GO equipment. If we use EMU equipment with a specialized track with modern signalization, we, we get tremendous performance advantage and we can fund it by canceling the SSE. That'd be the- Thank you, Mr. Shen. I appreciate your taking the three minutes. Are there questions of this deputy? Well, thank you very much for being here this morning. Uh, Hamish Wilson is the next uh, deputy. I do hope that you were able to absorb Mr. Shen's comments uh, uh, because it is complex and I fear that we are potentially not doing the best that we could even though it is really complex. I struggle with it all as I'm sure some of you do. I am, like in theory, yes, uh, it's very easy to support intensifying the use and the reuse of the existing rail lines in Toronto and it's overdue. Uh, going back a few years to uh, the uh, 1985 downtown relief line uh, concept there, you can see the Western Corridor being targeted for its, uh, its usage for, uh, for transit. And yes, the UPX Corridor should be repurposed somehow. It's not good enough. And, and we could actually, if we really were able to, I know it's complex between the technologies and the railway rules and the federal level and the this and the space constraints, but if we somehow were able to uh, intensify the usage from Dundas West down through the rail tracks along Front or King, as Mr. Chen suggested, getting off of Union Station just by a little bit, and then going east to the main of Danforth, where uh, it's very linked up, they're very proximate near to each other. That might be a way of providing faster, cheaper downtown relief to the Bluer Danforth subway. And somehow I think we've got to squeeze the billions. Uh, and I certainly think we should start with the Scarborough subway extension. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the politics of transit planning, <laughs> they seem to be a bit skewed. It's not a new thing. Uh, but we, uh, we are, and we're prone to making mistakes and they tend to be costly mistakes. So we need to squeeze the billions and we need to do things effectively. So I'm hoping that we're able to take enough time to actually uh, do things well. Uh, another thing that is not done so well in terms of really thinking about the, using the rail corridors, the, um, and I didn't bring down the proper map, but beside the Don Valley Parkway, there's a spur line that's owned by Metrolinx. It could be, I think, extended up to touch Thorncliffe 
and also to extend north uh, to get up to the rich, it basically lines up uh, parallel to the uh, to the Young Subway, and I think there's a way. If like, why hasn't that been included in the uh, in the smart track processes and the go electrification? If it's merely the flooding issues of the Don Valley, let's start to solve that by uh, addressing the flood surges from all the pavement and the parking lots and the rooftops. Uh, I think there's a way of, of in, uh, getting young relief uh, with, with the RER and a different look at the, uh, the, the smart track and being smart about it all, um, not just in name only. Uh, with the, uh, going back to the uh, uh, smart aspect, um, I wish we could revisit the smart spur uh, angle uh, to have a spur line come off from uh, the the this line here to get over to Scarborough Town Centre just to make sure that we improve the uh, uh, the services Scarborough Town Centre and I, I think that part of the solution again for Scarborough is using that Gatineau Hydro corridor. Three minutes is not enough time, but thank you for the well, audience. Uh, thank you very much for taking the three minutes. We appreciate that. <coughs> there, <coughs> excuse me. Questions of Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much. Uh, Vincent Puhaka. Is Mr. Vincent Puhaka here? Not here. Okay. Uh, we'll call again before we finish up with the deputations. Brenda Thompson, Scarborough Transit Action. Uh, good morning, Ms. Thompson. Uh, three minutes. Good Look morning, Mayor. Hard. Tory and members of the executive. Um, okay, I'd like to talk about the Lawrence East Smart Track station. I was at the public consultation held for Smart Track in Scarborough, but none of my concerns about this plan or those of others have been included or addressed in the report before you. It seems the city has adopted a take no prisoners approach with the Lawrence East Smart Track proposal. Um, here are some of the things that have not been addressed. The Lawrence East GO station will not provide access to the town centre. Many riders on the Lawrence East buses transfer at the existing RT station to go up to Scarborough Town Centre where they can transfer to other buses at the Triton Terminal. Uh, uh, they won't have direct, direct access anymore. They'll have to transfer to buses, either the 21 Brimley, the 43 Kennedy, which only run during rush hour, or the 16 McCowan or the 9 Brimley, which only run every 20 minutes. So to serve the GO trains, the station at Lawrence East will have to be completely rebuilt in a form that is much less accessible because under the current plan, uh, instead of going down to the, R to the station, passengers will have to get off at the Lawrence East overpass and walk down several flights of stairs to get to the uh, smart track station. Uh, and that's a problem. Um, the other, one of the other concerns is they'll get less service for a higher fare. So at this point, uh, they're going to have to go walk down a flight of stairs, wait for a GO train, which isn't going to come until for maybe eight to 15 minutes. And then they're going to have to pay an extra fare. So far, all we know is that that TTC, that GO train fare will be less $1.50, but they're still have to, going to have to pay more to get downtown. Uh, and the loss of five and potentially seven stops result in more people on buses and longer travel times to get around Scarborough. Uh, the seven stop Scarborough LRT would have included all five RT stops and added two new ones, one at Centennial College and Shep Shepherd Avenue. But the report does not acknowledge this fact. It's very clear the Lawrence East Smart Track will not make up for the elimination of rapid transit for the 10,000 riders currently using the Lawrence East RT station. Uh, and I just wanted to um, ra raise your attention about the fact that the, um, the Metrolink's business ca case, the initial business case, has concluded that the Lawrence East Smart Track station is not a good idea. It would result in more congestion uh, and you would have a net loss of 490 riders on the, uh, the electrified GO trains. Uh, and the other thing is that um, Metrolink's employs a business case framework uh, which is used to determine whether or not projects are good use of public funds. And in that framework, they call for a comparison with 
the business as, as usual scenario. So with the case of the Lawrence East Smart Track, we're being told this station is to replace the existing RT, but there has been no comparison with the existing RT. The, the Lawrence East Smart Track is being compared to the GO electrification. And that doesn't exist yet. Conclude, if you would. So I would really like you to reconsider this plan and make sure that Scarborough Transit riders get to get around Scarborough. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Thompson. Uh, are there questions of Ms. Thompson? Uh, Councillor Davis. Um, I'm over here. Oh, um, so recently I read um, comments and social media that there are a lot of residents of Scarborough who don't realize that that station at Lawrence um, is going to disappear on the SRT. Could you? That's correct. That? Yes, Scarborough Transit Action did a survey. We went to the Lawrence East RT station and we asked riders if they knew that the station was going to be closed and 85% of them responded no. They had no idea. The other thing that's interesting is we don't have any costings associated um, with SmartTrack at all. And um, I'm wondering if um, it's, that is something that is concerning to your group um, as we move forward with these projects without uh, any additional costing information. Yes, we are, concerns, uh, we are concerned about the fact that uh, we don't know what this will cost specifically and um, until we know that, we, we don't have any way of knowing whether there's value for money in this project. Um, of course, the other issue is fares and uh, having um, one fare or an integrated fare system. Um, have you had discussions with your community about what fares should be, would need to be before they would use Smart Track, for instance, or RER? Well, I, I certainly think that um, for transit riders in Scarborough, uh, they need to have a TTC GO co-fare in order for them to, to take any of the GO transit lines. Uh, because they just, it's hard enough for them to, to uh, pay for the TTC fare. Um, I don't know whether you've heard, but Scarborough, the poverty rate in Scarborough has gone up uh, exponentially. And we no longer have a, a very much of a middle class in Scarborough. It's a lot of low income people in our outer neighborhoods. And so asking them to pay an extra go fare, it's just not gonna happen. They're not gonna be able to manage it. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Other uh, questions of Ms. Thompson? I just had a couple if I could, Ms. Thompson, just to, uh, uh, have you confirmed for us, you have no reason to believe that uh, the discussions that are taking place uh, on a concurrent basis all the time now on, on the subject of fair integration, you have no reason to believe those discussions uh, aren't going to reach a satisfactory conclusion in terms of a fair integration um, as between uh, the different transit systems that are taking part in those discussions? I have no idea what those discussions will result okay. in. So, so you would have no reason to believe then that they won't reach a satisfactory conclusion, you'd agree with me on that? I don't have any reason to believe they will either. Okay, and you'd have no reason, you'd have no reason to believe that the co-fare, which is part of the objective of that, to have smart track uh, for the price of a TTC fare, you, you would have no evidence, no reason whatsoever not to think that that could be achieved. I mean, it's, it's under active discussion, would you acknowledge that? I would acknowledge it's under discussion, but I would urge you to make an announcement as soon as possible, especially when you're planning your transit line to replace the Scarborough RT station. If you really expect it's going to provide equivalent service levels every four minutes at a TTC fare, I would be coming out and saying that right now so that well, people know what they're getting. It's been said many times that that's our objective, but we're in discussions with, I think, 12 other transit systems and, and with Metrolinx to achieve all that, and it's, this is one element in a plan. You'd agree that, that it's a complicated matter. It's fair integration. You'd agree with that? I agree it's a complicated matter, but I urge you to um, keep that, in, make sure that information is available and upfront before we keep moving ahead with this project. And you would acknowledge that the first step along the way, and you, acknowledge, you did acknowledge it specifically, if the first step 
along the way, uh, and it's a step forward, is the dollar fifty that people will now get, and it's not everything, but it's a first step forward. It's the first time we've ever done, you'd acknowledge, it's the first time we've ever seen any kind of recognition, in this case by the province, to fund uh, some of the differential between uh, TTC and uh, GO Transit. You, you've, you acknowledge that yourself. I acknowledge that, but I don't think it's enough to, uh, to really replace the existing RT service with four stations, uh, including the Lawrence RT station. I don't think that is going to replace that service. Okay, and thank I you very much. You to look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Ms. Thompson? All right. In that case, we move along to uh, to uh, John DeSalvo, Richmond Gardens Ratepayers Association, RGR. Good morning. We would like to interrupt this meeting for just one moment. There's a bunch of us here, TTC writers, and following up on Ms. Thompson's excellent. No, but uh, Matt, I'm sorry. We have that an important message to bring from your constituents. That Good, miserable people of Toronto. Right? I, I have to ask. I have to ask, ma'am. We are ma tired of overcrowding. We are tired of high fares. We are tired of unreliable service. And Mr. Tory, we are here to deliver a message from your constituents that we demand the kind of budget that increases the TTC's operating budget because um, we are tired of overcrowding and we have a message of woes on the bus. We have been talking to transit riders across the city. We have been collecting no, woes on the bus. Hey, ma'am. Like Thank you very much. We appreciate, yeah, we appreciate your coming here today. We, we. And perhaps you could just make your way out of the room and continue to serenade us. Thank you very much for coming. All right, and if, if you could accompany your friends, you could have registered to speak to the meeting in accordance with the rules, and you were more than welcome to do so. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. So, uh, Mr. DeSalvo, I had just called for to come for his uh, deputation from the Richmond Gardens Ratepayers Association on item 29.1. Good morning, Mr. DeSalvo. Thank you for coming. Are you going to sing or just... Uh, oh, I think I'm, uh, I'm going to read. I'm going to read. We have... Uh, you have three minutes and uh, you're most welcome here. I'm here today because I'm very concerned and the people in my community are very concerned about what has been proposed for the Eglinton West LRT project. There have been at least three meetings where government officials have come to Etobicoke to get input from what we want to see happen with the LRT extension. There was a meeting on February 20, 2016 at Richwood Collegiate. There was a meeting in May 2016 at Martin Grove Collegiate where the Minister of Transportation, Stephen Del Duca, and the then President of Metrolinx, Bruce McCogg, were out to hear and get input from the community. And recently there was a meeting on November 13, 2017, where the city staff came out to Martin Grove Collegiate to hear what the community has to say. In all three of these meetings, there were hundreds and hundreds of residents, and the message was very clear and loud to the city staff. If you are going to extend the LRT and bring it west along Eglinton from Mount Dennis to Renforth, then it must be tunneled. An at-grade solution is not an option. Why? We do not want another St. Clair mistake in our community. The traffic on Eglinton is already very congested, and there are new high-rise developments which are coming into our neighborhood and that an act rate solution will destroy any quality of life our community is presently enjoying. So instead of trying to convince us with studies that, are so, that have so many unanswered questions and flawed assumptions, with the hope of changing our minds, do the right thing and deliver what the residents and ratepayers are asking for. When asked directly to the city staff, why are you not promoting a tunneled solution, the answer is always the same. A tunneled solution is too expensive. What does that mean, too expensive? Too expensive for whom? Is it too expensive for the City of Toronto to fund it on its own? Absolutely. But why does it have to be the City of Toronto that bears all the cost? There are different levels of government that have a responsibility to the taxpayers. For example, where did the funding come from to pay for the Crosstown East LRT? It came from multiple levels of government. Why isn't that funding model being promoted for the Eglinton West LRT? Let's look at another example, recent example from a article in the Toronto Star dated November 17th by um, 
uh, uh, David Ryder, the City Hall bu Bureau. Toronto's newest subway line is now just one month away. In less than a month, the Toronto York Spadina subway extension will open. On Friday, Toronto Mayor John Tory, Ontario Minister Stephen Del Duca, and others gathered at the new Downsview station to start uh, clicking down uh, probably the single greatest transit achievement on my life, Stephen Del Duca said. It's amazing to see what we can achieve when we work together, Tory said, of all three levels of government. Along with the enthusiasm and anticipation, the extension has experienced some growing pains, including delays and overruns. The cost more than doubled initial estimates to $3.2 billion, including $500 million not attributed to the addition of extra stops. Funding at all it was split between Ottawa, Queen's Park, York Region and Toronto with the city's contribution of roughly $900 million. This was declared a success, even though there was much cost overrun. I have to ask you to just conclude. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there so will be some my questions. My point to all this is, <clears throat> where is the political will to create this cooperation? I will end by saying this. Listen to the people. They are the ones who elect you. Respect us. Do not dismiss us. Channel, as elected officials, channel your energy to creating the political will from all levels all right. of government to put in place the necessary funding to do the right thing and tunnel the Eglinton West LRT. Thank you, Mr. DeSalvo, on that note, and uh, I'm sure there will be some questions uh, for you, and I see Councillor Campbell. Thank, thank you, John, for coming down today. Uh, you were at the November 13th uh, consultation, and you've attended a number of the other consultations. Just uh, generally, um, what, was the, what was the mood in the room that evening in regard to the options that were presented by city staff about the routing of the LRT across Eglinton? Well, it was very clear. Uh, everybody there very loudly said, we want a study that shows a tunneled LRT. Stop delivering to us a decision that you've already made that there is no option for that. And the, and the issue was, we want to see that information. We want to understand what the costs are. We want to be able to debate that and then approach the different level of a government so that we can canvass them at election time and see where their level is in supporting the funding for that kind of, uh, of construction. W would you say that residents of, you know, Toboco Centre, whether it's in Ward 3 or Ward 4, are generally supportive of mass transit? Absolutely. We're not against the transit, but it has to be the right transit. It has to be something that's going to allow more people to move quickly. We don't want just more people to move, but they've got to move quickly along Eglinton. And do you think an, an above-grade LRT that's, that has no grade separations would make traffic worse or better along Eglinton? Well, no question it's going to make it worse. Uh, right now, we're, we're, we're still not sure. A lot of things, of, uh, things like left-hand turns, uh, whether they'll still have a bus service, like duplicating more service. Uh, there, there's so many unanswered questions. There's going to be new development that's going to require left-hand turns between Wincott and Kipling, and that hasn't been brought into it. Okay. There's going to be Plant World coming in with more requests as well, too. So th there's a lot of unanswered questions. So we want them to listen and bring the information forward. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Campbell. Councillor Holliday, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, John, thanks for talking to us today. Um, your association is, is large and it's busy. Uh, I know that you've been involved, you've come to Topico Community Council and, and spoken to councillors about developments and traffic issues. Would you say that there's capacity in your association to spend time, or have you already spent time doing some analysis on the staff materials? I think you even have a scientist that's a member of... We, we have some very talented and capable people in our community who are very engaged in all this. They, want, they come forward, they, we're all volunteering our time. I'm down here today away from my business. The point is we are very concerned of what's going to happen. We love the area we live in and we don't want people who don't live in our area to make decisions that will destroy what we enjoy right now. Rather than an opposition, would you say that members of your association would like to <clears throat> cooperate more with the city to spend time and to roll up their sleeves and actually put some sweat equity into this and, and work together? But I think one of the things I heard was that there just wasn't a complete amount of information or there, there, was, there wasn't access into the black box that had to do with the, the algorithms and the studies and the engineering and there's people that want to get into that. Absolutely. There were a lot of questions. Uh, there was a stakeholders meeting on October 23rd as well too uh, for a few of us. A lot of questions were raised about all these assumptions and these 
these, these studies that were done, and it is very obvious that they're, 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 they're not being transparent and they're being flawed. And they're, like I said, we have very capable people in our community that are highly educated, understand this kind of stuff, and they want to participate. We're not against traffic. We want more traffic, but it's got to be the right kind of traffic. Okay, and, and also, I, right now, there's construction going on Eglinton. There's resurfacing, and so they've got the lanes reduced. Um, traffic is down to two lanes. What has been the impact of that construction on what I would call very, very residential garden plan neighborhoods that are parallel to Eglinton Avenue? What, what has this construction done and, and ha do you sense people have, have drawn an inference from the, those experiences to what may happen with an Eglinton LRT? Absolutely, there's been an infiltration of many cars coming into, into neighborhoods that were not designed for that kind of traffic. And uh, the people are feeling very anxious. And, and as I said, with, with new development, high rises being promoted on our, on our, in our corridor, it's only going to get worse. And so we're asking for the people that make these decisions to respect what's going on in our area. Listen to us. Don't ignore us. Listen to us. Come out and listen to us and engage the people in power at different levels of government to put the money forward to build and construct the right form of transit. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Other uh, members of council or members of the committee wishing to ask questions? I just have one for you myself, sir. Um, and that is, uh, I'm sure you don't set your business schedule, and I appreciate very much your being here today and the thought you, that you put into your remarks. I'm sure you don't set your business schedule by the timing of my news conferences, but were you, I'll just ask you, were you aware uh, this morning I indicated publicly, and, and I will later on in this item in the next little while, uh, be moving a motion to, uh, I think consistent with what you said, direct staff to form a working group of community stakeholders and councillors and others to uh, work uh, on investigating further grade separation or tunneling uh, options and to further traffic modeling and, and, and an enhanced framework that addresses community interests. So is that something that would be responsive to what you've said today? Absolutely. There are people in our community who want to be part of that group and work with you. To we are going to be hopefully passing that today and making that opportunity available. So I thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. That was the end of the deputation. So we would then move to uh, questions of staff by uh, visiting members of council, if there are any. Uh, Councillor Holliday, Deputy Mayor Holliday. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wonder if, uh, if staff could articulate a little bit about what a Michigan left is and what a protected green is and why that's extremely important to traffic flow along Eglinton. They're small words buried in the report, <clears throat> but I would say that they do have a significant impact. And I know I'm time constrained, so I'd ask you to try to be succinct in what, the, what they mean. So in the, uh, through the chair, in the uh, original study for, uh, or EA for the, uh, the Eglinton LRT, there was a reference to including Michigan lefts, which are a little bit of a convoluted approach to um, a series of right turns instead of, instead of lefts, but we will be investigating as part of this uh, signaling options that would, uh, that would, eliminate the need for Michigan lefts. There may be other ways that we can deal with those issues besides so that. Protected green was the other one. Um, does the, can you succinctly describe what that is and why that's important? Uh, yes, Councillor. Protected green uh, refers to the opportunity to turn left across, uh, to turn left from Eglinton, for example, to a southbound or northbound cross street uh, only, when a, only when a signal permiss, uh, permits it. So that's a, like an arrow, uh, an advanced green. Right per se, rather than waiting for a gap in traffic. So would it be fair to say that a protected green set of light signals offers a significant delay rather than a free-flowing green for somebody that wants to go left and changes the green time economics of the intersection, which would also affect the north and south travel of uh, cars and TTC buses that, say, flow up and down Kipling or Islington or Roy York, which are other major arteries? So. Through the, uh, the chair, it is safe to say that there would be traffic impacts from uh, different signaling options. We don't have uh, the details of what those would be yet. Okay. But. Um, one of the things mentioned in the report is that there's other work going on in parallel to this particular project and study. And I will note specifically, uh, there's a discussion about the highway interchange of the 401, 427, and 27 highways really looking at a macro view of, of changes to traffic. However, the report talks about it as 
implementing those alternatives uh, as, as, an, as an alternative to grade separations at say an intersection like Martin Grove, why would we want to just be on with that work recognizing that Eglinton is a very busy street and that work is really required because of um, maybe some inadequacies of the highway traffic and, uh, and uh, major artery network today? Through the chair, we are doing uh, a study at the Martin Grove and Eglinton intersection because of the very reasons that you mentioned. We are working with MTO. We uh, would like to identify different um, measures that could be taken to improve that, but some of that would require MTO's cooperation because of the traffic that's flowing uh, into and off of the 427 and 401 in that area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Holliday, Deputy Mayor. I have Councillor Perks next, and Councillor, we've got Councillor Perks, Councillor Davis, and then Councillor Campbell. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not sure who should take this question. Uh, when we last discussed the, this plan, uh, the staff recommendation had been that when we get to the third uh, f uh, design stage, that then we should get some financing option. Council, in its wisdom, decided that wasn't adequate. Councillor Mahevic moved a motion that passed, saying that in this quarter we should get an update on the financing for the RER stations and other aspects of Smart Track. Uh, I don't see that here. Why not? So I'll start, um, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, uh, we have two imperatives that we are trying to get move forward with this report. But one, the, the most important one, is to getting the TPAPs on the station concepts approved. Unfortunately, the station concepts have not been refined to a detailed design level that we would have liked to have had for the financing estimates, and so we're actually coming forward with this TPAP recommendation absent the uh, financing, which we would like to have had, but have been delayed in getting the accurate estimates from Metrolinx. So, so my question wasn't um, whether or not you know the total amount of funding that you need. My question was why, given that you had a specific direction from Council to provide us with an update on the types of financing, the types of financing, not the amount, the types, in this quarter, why, where is that? Council dir directed it. Uh, through the chair. So uh, last year about this time, uh, we actually in fact tabled a, a preliminary financing strategy that dealt with TIFs and development charges. And that was predicated on very little design work and hence higher order of magnitude of costs. Uh, recognizing that Council did in fact ask us to come back with a more definitive financing strategy, we felt that that was a premature given that we do not have the level of design and the level of cost estimates uh, that can provide us the basis for a definitive financing strategy. We were also engaged with Metrolinx on the procurement strategy which, which allocates risks and those risks have financial implications. And to the extent that those agreements on procurement have yet to be concluded, it was felt that it would be premature to provide you with any sort of a financing strategy at this point in time. Councilor Perks, all done? <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Davis. Um, Councillor Perks did ask my first question as well uh, from recommendation 25 of the last report. It also recommended that you undertake further discussions to restore broader operating subsidy with the provincial government. Have we had those discussions? So there, we are having discussions uh, broadly speaking on uh, transit funding with the province and with Metrolinx. Um, recognizing that, in fact, Council did set a direction at the, uh, with the adoption of the report in November. Could you remind me what we committed to to include in the budget that had to do with um, uh, various costs associated with uh, Metrolink's infrastructure? So for 2018, we've already committed to put, I think, $40 million into... Uh, 43 million into the budget for um, yes, with res track. with respect to the uh, smart track project, yeah. our, uh, council did in fact approve um, some funding for preliminary design EA work, <coughs> and uh, that amount is included in the budget. I believe it 
amounts to $71 million. So, and in addition, we committed to the 15% contribution to various infrastructure. And how much is that? $62 million. Pardon me? $62 million is a portion of the 417 grade separation work that was done. So there's $150 million for Metrolinx, funding of Metrolinx projects. Is there anything more we've committed to? There are no other commitments beyond that. Uh, we have included in the 10-year budget uh, the preliminary costs for uh, SmartTrack, which on a net basis amount to a little over $2 billion. Um, one of the things that c has concerned me from the beginning is this, co this joint project, essentially, and how we're going to separate out what are our costs versus the base costs, enhancements versus base. Where can I find that in the you're, scope you're at correct. this it's point? Have we identified the scope yet? We have de we've identified the detail that we're doing the detailed design on the stations, and we're in no. active discussions with Metrolinx on the share between RER and the smart track contribution to it. Okay, so we're proceeding forward without really understanding what is our scope in this project between the base costs and the enhanced What's costs, the or the scope? incremental. What is the base cost? No, we're proceeding with that specific quest in mind. We're trying to make sure that the uh, costs attributable to smart track are truly smart track so, costs from the city, and that not, uh, not are being cross-subsidized, or be, we're being will, expected will to cross-subsidize Will we have that in the next RER. report? Yes, you will. In March, we will have our exact our hope, costs right? and share. Well, through through the chair, we, we will expect updated costs from Metrolinx uh, in the next month or so on the station designs, and we will be undertaking a validation of those costs to get at some of those very questions that you're asking, Councillor, about what is the RER portion, what is the smart track portion, so that we can present that to Council in full. But to be clear, we need in, this next, in the next report to identify progress on our negotiations with Metrolinx, the province, on the distribution of costs between RER and the smart track. We'll have to have some sense of the overall costing. Hopefully we'll have those cost, those class three costs to, to inform you. And we have to show you how that rolls out in context of the TPAP uh, process. Has there ever been a co-proponent project before? Yes, there's, they're fairly common. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Davis. Um, that would bring us next to Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you. I think this uh, question might be for the Deputy City Manager. Um, uh, the list of unfunded transit priorities is reasonably long. Uh, where would the Eglinton West LRT be on the list of priorities of unfunded transit priorities? And we have, we have East Bayfront, Downtown Relief Line, Eglinton East LRT to, Scarborough town, uh, Scar uh, to the Scarborough campus of the U of T, and there's the whole waterfront reset. Uh, is that, that's a, that's a is that a comprehensive list of unfunded transit at this point in time? So, Mr. Mr. Mayor, the the uh, Smart Track Eglinton West um, LRT is a priority of council. It's been identified as such. All right, my we question. We come back with a financing strategy on it, but it has been identified as a priority. As a priority, but I would say the question was where on the list of transit initiatives that are unfunded would this would this rank? And and will 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 staff be coming back to us with a prioritized list? of transit priorities, transit, transit projects. So, Mr. Mayor, I have to make a distinction between the unfunded and priorities. We have established a priority for the uh, extension of the Blur Danforth out to Scarborough. That's, that's that is approved by council. Which is funded. We've approved the smart track stations, and we have approved the idea of an LRT on Eglinton West. So those have, have been identified. We've also identified Eglinton East as a priority, and we're coming back with a report next, uh, next time to executive on waterfront, which is always rate, rated high in priority, okay. and it is it is also unfunded. Okay, question is for uh, Mr. Pertola. When when will can we expect that study on Eglinton and Martin Grove that you refer to in Councillor Holliday's questions? Through the uh, through the mayor, we uh, expect the results of that study early in 2018. And and is that is is that going to come to community council or city council for recommendations? Uh, the results of that study would be wrapped up into uh, into our further analysis and work on the uh, on the LRT and would be reported back to council at our next 
report back to Council. Okay. And just a question about the, about the report that's before us today uh, and the recommendations about not having grade separations along Eglinton. There were a number of uh, community consultations. Metrolinx was involved. Uh, the city was involved. There, as the deputant uh, from my area pointed out, there were a number. Why, why did, does the report not make any reference to the feedback from the community if we've been doing all of these consultations? So th through, the, uh, through the mayor, the report does talk about the, uh, the things that we have heard from, from the community as well. Um, we have sent out meeting summaries to all participants. Uh, in, uh, those went out yesterday and have also been uh, monitoring and doing a roll-up of what we've been seeing in our online surveys. Um, and all our past consultations, the full report on those consultations is available on our, on our uh, project website. Okay, but it, so you're, so in this report, I mean... Did, Last question. Yeah, okay. In this report, the staff recommendation to not have grade separations, I, I mean, did, did, uh, did staff give consideration to what the community overwhelmingly stated was their preference for either underground or grade separated intersections? Through the, uh, through the chair, the report, uh, Appendix 2 on pages 10 and 11 includes a fuller description of the, uh, of the public consultation summary. Um, the, the direction that we were given by council was to examine the LRT options and to look at their feasibility, which is what we did, and we went back to talk to the com to community about that. The community was clearly, clearly, at least at the first meeting, very uh, supportive of tunneling. The second meeting was quite different, Councillor, uh, and, and we had a much broader range of opinions expressed, and what we're seeing in terms of our online feedback on this is a broader range of feedback as well, and different positions than what we heard overwhelmingly at the first meeting. Very good, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Campbell. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, uh, this is about the stage four, page five, and the authority to proceed to the TPAP. Will that TPAP be initiated by the city and Metrolinx or city and Go? Who are the initiators? The city and Metrolinx, Mr. Mayor. City and Metrolinx. And this is for the stations? It's for the stations, yes. The six of them? Correct. Um, and then Metrolinx also has some other work that's underway that we would consider a companion to the stations or a prerequisite for the stations. Do they have a TPAP out for the widening of the corridor? They, through, uh, through the chair, there are a, a broad range of EAs in the process. Uh, we're just looking up for the specific, uh, the specific dates on, on the Lakeshore East mm -hmm. Corridor and Stouffville Corridors. So Metrolinx has a number of TPAPs that are out to upgrade the corridor for the 15-minute service. Is that right? That is correct. And, and the, the, uh, the, Stouffville, the Stouffville Corridor EA, particularly in Scarborough, is already underway. In your area, there's still work going on, Councillor. So the uh, TPAP is underway on Stouffville. That's for widening, the, adding the fourth line in order to accommodate the increased traffic. It's the second correct. line. In, in it's the yeah. second line. And then is there one, an EA underway for the electrification as well? Again, there's specific corridor TPAPs. So there's a Lakeshore East TPAP. There's a Lakeshore, you know, there's a variety of TPAPs, all in aid of implementing RER. So we don't have a list of that. Probably by council, I'll just want to we, see we their TPAP list. list. Yes. And then we're engaged with, smart, with RER, with Metrolinx on the station TPAPs. That is correct, Mr. Mayor. But not on all the other ones. They're doing those as on their own. We're, we're aware of those TPAPs. But we're not, we're not a partner. We're at the table in discussions with them on a... I understand we're at the table, but on the TPAP, City Council will authorize the TPAP for the stations. Is that correct? The request is for authorization for... Pardon me? The request is to Council give us the authorization to be a co-proponent right. on the stations uh, that you see before you today. And I understand we're at the table, as uh, others, many others are, but we're not the proponent of the TPAP for the widening, let's say. The RER program is a Metrolinx program, and they right. are the proponents. They are the, the they are what we're calling the proponents. So this is, our, this is our baby. The stations are our baby. That is correct. Do we have any idea of the estimated cost per station uh, 
like a cookie cutter, not the big fancy one that we all know about, that we were at a meeting about last week. But Costs it, really vary tremendously depending on the configuration. Um, the complicated ones like your station and your ward uh, councillor uh, and uh, East Harbour, uh, the uh, Liberty Village, they're re relatively complicated and really tight geographies with diff difficult access and egress. Uh, more typical ones like St. Clair and uh, Finch, for example, are uh, more economical and come in under $100 million. Uh, okay. A thank you, uh, Councillor Fletcher, and thank, thank you, you uh, Mr. Libby. Uh, so uh, that uh, brings to an end the members from outside the committee that had questions of staff. Uh, now we'll move to the uh, committee, and I have Councillor Palacio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. With regards to the community consultation, recommendation 1A, the Sanclair West, the Sanclair or Western Smart Track Station is being coordinated with the ongoing work with the, um, that's with the Transportation Master Plan. So in terms of the TTAP, these two aspects are going to be part of it. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Mayor, they're to be fully coordinated. Yeah. Now, in terms of um, the transportation, transportation master plan for the um, St. Clair, I understand there is going to be a, a few concepts that will be shared with the local community in terms of input to getting input from the community. How is that input going to be a part of the of the TD, of the of the TPAP? So through the chair, we uh, anticipate further consultations with the communities around these stations in uh, February of next year, and at that time, we will be uh, in the St. Clair area, bringing out information about options related to the transportation master plan, as well as the station. So at that point, the community would have an opportunity to learn, to be informed about both aspects that is of uh, the smart track as well as the master transportation plan and perhaps and choose one of the options or the preferred alternatives before decisions are made at council. Is that correct? That's correct. And that information somehow will come to council so as part of our report to council in, in Q2 of 2018, this, this links to uh, the uh, confirming the station designs and the costing. We will include also related projects in, uh, in that report to council. So at St. Clair, we would, would include information about the transportation master plan and discuss ways that we may be able to advance both projects uh, concurrently. So there is going to be some uh, advanced aspects in terms of the master plan that are going to be discussed concurrently with, uh, the, with the station. Uh, through the chair, that is correct. We will be working with local councillors about uh, the materials that we will be going out with on the stations. So there will be an opportunity um, for you, councillor, to see what uh, what we plan to discuss with the with the residents around. That's fantastic. There. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Palazzo. Other uh, questions of staff by members of the committee? Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to staff. Um, on page uh, four of the report, there's a reference here of, of working in partnership with the City of Mississauga. Well, the last time, uh, an earlier iteration of, of this report, which mentioned a 400 plus uh, million cost to the city of Mississauga was, was met with um, shock and surprise um, by the uh, mayor of Mississauga. Are we making some progress in getting them to come to the table and pay their fair share? So through the chair, we're making progress in terms of them being at the table discussing the technical issues related to the LRT. We have not yet had a firm commitment from uh, Mississauga Council to uh, make a financial contribution to the project. Is this a go if they're not at the table financially? One of the discussions that we'll have at the Q2 2018 report is whether there's merit in extending the LRT just to the Renforth Gateway or if there is merit in a full extension of the LRT. So that'll be part of the conversation. So that's still up in the air. 
So on page 55 of the report, there's a reference to my favorite topic, commuter parking. And it's hard to tell from this. Um, there's a reference to uh, Councillor Kerry Gannis, who had a town hall, and everyone said they wanted 220 parking spots. There's a there's an identification of a cost here, um, acquisition of land, some, some other details. It's hard to tell from, this is at the Finch Kennedy Station. It's hard to tell from this whether staff are, are we, are we adopting a recommendation to build a commuter parking lot at that station? Through the chair, uh, the staff are not recommending the inclusion of commuter parking at any of the smart track stations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pasternak. Other, uh, yes, Councillor Bailo. Um, just a quick question is about uh, the bells uh, that continues to be an issue on some of the existing stations. And we had asked to have conversations started with the federal government and provincial government because it's going to be even a bigger issue uh, once we have all these stations. Can you uh, let us know how that is going and what has been done? So through the chair, there has been a number of requests made by the city to Transport Canada. Uh, we've also been in discussions with Metrolinx and the Ministry of Transportation, who is looking at a broader strategy for train bells and whistles across RAR in general, because it is not just a Toronto-specific issue. Uh, there has not been any conclusion yet to those discussions, however. So uh, have we, do we have any recommendations uh, to the province or the federal government, or we're just waiting for them to provide us with a solution? So we've been in discussions with them around looking at a range of potential options that balance the public safety interests as well as the, uh, the issue of the uh, train bells um, making a, a significant noise impact on communities. As I said, this is still an ongoing discussion and really Metrolinx as the train operator uh, is taking a lead on this particular issue. And when do we expect to have some resolution on these discussions? So the discussions, as I said, are still ongoing. We will provide a report back at our next report in Q2 2018 on how we are making progress. This is part of the broader range of issues that Metrolinx is still working through as part of their RER program. So we will have a section reporting back on this on the next report? We will provide an update for sure. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Bailo. Uh, are there um, other members of the committee wishing to ask questions of staff? All right, uh, then uh, we'll move to speakers and uh, those outside the committee wishing to speak, uh, did, uh, Councillor Holliday, uh, did you, okay, Deputy Mayor Holliday will speak first and uh, others can sign up as they wish. Councillor Davis. I'm gonna do my best to shout and operate the projector. Uh, I just would like to say uh, thank you to you, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, for uh, the, the leadership that you're taking on looking at um, continued work on, on tunneling or grade separations along Eglinton Avenue. I just wanted to talk to the committee about why this is so important to us. We had a recent community meeting and if you think this is a sleeper issue, it is not. Yeah, the room was filled to the rafters with people that are very concerned about quality of life in Etobicoke Centre. We have a taste of that right now because of the construction going on along Eglinton has caused traffic to infiltrate on many, many parallel routes, uh, dramatically affecting the quality of people's lives. This is a very long-standing issue. Just a quick look at the highway system in the area. People will know that we've got the 403, the 401, the 427, the 401 again, and Eglinton Avenue right here. Long ago, there was an expressway that was planned along Eglinton Avenue that was never built. But Eglinton continues to survive to this day as what I would characterize as a super artery, not a major artery, but a super artery. There's a lot of cars. So if you look at this strip that we're studying right now, you've got the 401, 427 interchange, and this begins right here. And you can see essentially the highway empties out onto Eglinton Avenue. And what you get is traffic behavior that is very indicative of this super artery. People come off of the highway, they come along Eglinton and they use this as a way to disperse within the neighborhood along the cross major arteries and on. 
Why I really worry about this is that it doesn't function as a typical east-west road. Everything leads back to the highway, so at the end of the day, people operate in reverse, and you've got people collecting along Eglinton and heading towards the highway, getting on the highway, and treating this as a very regional transportation system. I've shown this to council before. Look at that. There's the artery, the vein system. I believe that the, the roadways behave no differently. And the addition of an LRT, if not done very, very carefully, is tantamount to severing one of the arteries. And what you get is, as gross as this sounds, is bleeding. And that is really the worry about the people of the neighborhood, is traffic spilling over into the quieter streets in the neighborhood to get around a blocked Eglinton Avenue. We talked about uh, some of the intersections and what Michigan turns mean. That means that if you wanted to go left this way, you can't do that anymore. You'd have to go right in order to go left once again to go back through the intersection. And that's why grade separations are so important at these major intersections because they affect traffic flow in both directions. I think what we have is a tremendously engaged community that wants to roll up their sleeves and work with the city. The work has started. We've gone through a rapid transit evaluation framework. I'm not sure that the community is entirely convinced about all of the findings in this and what they are doing is looking forward to working with the city to further refine this and have some equal footing and some equal say. I thank you for thank that. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, any, uh, so we, we will uh, then move from uh, Deputy Holliday to uh, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did want to just identify again some of the concerns I've expressed in the past and while I do believe that uh, smart track or RER um, can provide some additional options that could in the absence of the relief line uh, provide some additional um, options for for uh, travelers and uh, provide some relief at Young and um, young and Bloor. Um, but we are again moving this project uh, ahead with virtually no information about how we're going to pay for it. Um, and secondly, what the ridership will be and what the fares will be, which, which are completely linked as we've known all along. So I'm hoping at when this next report comes back, and we will be hopefully at 30% design uh, in 2018, uh, I guess Q2 2018, uh, that we will know better how much it's actually going to cost the people of Toronto. Um, one of my concerns all along has been um, how are we going to make sure that we identify those costs that are specifically Toronto's versus those costs that are Metrolinks in this um, integrated model that we're building and how are we going to ensure uh, that the additional operating costs, uh, we haven't seen yet how the incremental operating costs are going to be identified as well with these stations. So there still remains some huge question marks. Um, about whether or not this is going to be a viable, affordable uh, transit option for the people of Scarborough. Um, and we continue to hear that many people don't realize with the Scarborough subway extension that their reliance, uh, uh, that, that the station at Lawrence will be gone and uh, this is going to be the option. So we've got to make sure that it's going to be affordable that the frequency that we've been promised will actually be there and that we won't be carrying um, any uh, of the uh, additional operating costs. Now, we've already committed, unfortunately, to 100% of the operating costs of the LRTs. We've committed to 70 million in sunk costs on SmartTrack. Uh, and if we find ourselves in any way getting off one of these stage gates, we will be paying for this. So I think, you know, we all have to be very cautious and I hope fully informed uh, in the new year when we decide whether or not to actually proceed with building these stations.
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no, uh, there's no ward that stands to benefit more for, uh, than, than Ward 4 from mass transit with the Eglinton West LRT, but there's also no ward that could be more detrimentally affected than Ward 4. And uh, residents in my ward and in Councillor Holliday's ward are generally supportive of mass transit, but they realize that the permanency of this infrastructure they know that it's there for 50 or 60 years. They, see, they have seen examples of mass transit not done well in other parts of the city, and they don't want that sort of not well done mass transit coming along Eglinton, which is already a very, as Councillor Holliday uh, pointed out, a very problematic route uh, for, for traffic in Toronto. So I would, uh, I mean, they want to see a route that is either partially tunneled or fully grade separated so as to not inhibit traffic, which is already bad. And I guess, uh, so that, that's my comment on that, this particular project. And I guess the other comment that I would make has to deal with our transit priorities. Uh, the former chief planner said that transit, the transit planning department would be coming back with a list of priorities. This was presented to us about three years ago. We haven't seen anything else in terms of what actually matters most to the city. What, where will the funding, if, if funding becomes available, where will we channel our funds? Will it be East Bayfront? Will it be the waterfront reset that addresses the whole mess along Etobicoke's uh, lakeshore, down by Park Lawn or Lakeshore that Councillor Grimes talks about? Will it be the, the, uh, the downtown relief line that has been trumpeted as a, as a must have? Uh, will it be the Eglinton East LRT that was supposed to be part of the initial iteration of the Bloor Danforth extension to the uh, Scarborough Town Center, but then uh, vaporized the Eglinton East LRT to uh, to the Scarborough campus of the U of T. So there are many, we have a long wish list and I think we need to set priorities to it and that's the kind of uh, direction that I would like to see uh, coming from staff or at least somehow put some sort of list of priorities together so that we know that if funding comes from the province or, or a provincial government, we know where that money is going to be devoted. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, uh, Councillor Campbell. Uh, Councillor Perks. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin, I guess, by following on uh, from something Councillor Campbell said, which is we have a great many transit projects out there that we're hoping someday to be able to accomplish. But at the same time, we're about to enter into the final budget of uh, this term of office in just a few short weeks. It's going to be launched. We're going to be entering into that discussion uh, without either the long-range financial plan that we had been promised by this time nor are we going to be proceeding with uh, more thorough advice on what kind of financing is available for the projects described in this report. And yet we're continuing to contribute substantial tens of millions of dollars of public money into investigating this option. I, I must say that the people of Toronto would be rightfully deeply confused about what we're attempting to do here when we're moving forward a whole series of transit projects without any idea of how public finances from the City of Toronto will or will not be able to, to contribute to them. It's uh, not a great way to plan a transit system or to run a city and I'm, I'm profoundly disappointed we don't have that update which Council directed should be here and we don't have the long-range financial plan which Council directed should be here. We continue to just fly blind in terms of our transit planning in the City of Toronto, uh, adding priorities, subtracting priorities, changing priorities, without any context for what we can actually deliver. It's, it's poor governance and uh, it's a very poor way to plan the future of the City of Toronto. Thank you, Councillor Perks. Uh, any other members of the City Council not on the Executive Committee wishing to speak on this? All right, speakers from the Executive Committee. Well, if there are uh, no others, I have a motion and uh, uh, some comments to make. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I would say in, in response to some of the comments made by just, just a moment ago by Councillor Perks that um, 
in fact, uh, this is following a very orderly uh, process and it's a stage-gated process and that there are regular reports coming to this committee and uh, in an ideal world, there were a couple of other reports that were to have been here at the same time, but they're coming very shortly and I think people will easily be able to, in the context of both transit planning and budgets for 2018 and beyond, um, you know, to begin to better uh, put into context the uh, f financial uh, commitments that, uh, and uh, did, you, did you have that motion? So I just put that up because I'll speak to that in a moment, but I, it's just so it's there. Um, and, and so in that sense, I, I, I obviously don't accept uh, for one second uh, the comments. I think what I do accept, um, and I put to you, I respectfully put to, to all the members of council and to the public, is that, um, you know, contrast uh, the situation that, we're just, that was just described in fairly dire terms uh, with the situation we've had in most previous years where we've had basically no transit projects on the go. I mean, that, that's an exaggeration as well, as was, were the, some of the comments I would respectfully suggest made a moment ago. But I think that what we now have is a network transit plan for the city, which, yes, does absolutely positively uh, contain multiple transit projects to be proceeding with in large measure because previous councils at previous times uh, didn't proceed with very much. And they did manage to approve a lot of the growth that has taken place in the city in the context of development without the accompanying transit. And I'm not assessing that blame on any particular person, obviously, but it was a failure there of the kind of leadership that we now have to make up for. And I'm confident that the various mechanisms that we have at our disposal, including things such as uh, tax increment financing, which I know some members don't accept, including things such as the $170 million in new provincial money that is coming from gas tax, including things such as the uh, beginnings of the infrastructure fund that we, this very council, has established uh, during this term of office, uh, will uh, s slowly but surely put into place the answers we need with respect to uh, the financing of these projects, plus, of course, the participation of the other governments. I want to devote just the remaining one minute I have um, uh, to uh, the motion that I have up here, which is to simply be responsive in the time we have, because these are longer-term projects. There is a planning process where there has been time set aside, and without delaying it, um, we can be responsive to the, to the concerns uh, registered this morning uh, by Mr. DeSalvo, uh, DeSalvo and uh, also by some of our council colleagues, Councillors Campbell and Deputy Mayor Holliday, and also by Yvonne Baker, the local MPP, uh, so that we have the time and we have the willingness, uh, you heard it this morning, uh, to uh, get the community stakeholders to work with us, uh, with us meaning the city in the broadest sense. Uh, and so my motion directs staff to form a working group of community stakeholders in consultation with the local councillors uh, to investigate uh, further grade separation or tunneling options, uh, to develop traffic modelling and to develop an enhanced framework that looks at community interests. And I think it was said in very fair, balanced ways by both Deputy Mayor Holliday and Councillor Campbell uh, that uh, we can do better uh, if we sit down with these people. They're not rejecting the idea of transit at all. They just want to find better ways to do it that are respectful of the community. So my motion uh, will stand on the record uh, and, and I'll ask for your support on that. That concludes my own remarks. Uh, are there other, any others one last time? All right then, I guess the first thing we would proceed to do is to deal with the uh, motion that I put uh, with, uh, that amends the recommendations. Um, all those in favour? Opposed? Carried? Uh, unanimously. And then on the recommendations as recorded, amended? Recorded vote. Recorded please. vote on the recommendations as amended. Uh, all those in favour? Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bilal, Councillor Burnside, Councillor Crawford. Councillor McMahon, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Pasternak. All those opposed? Carried. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. That brings us then to uh, item uh, 29.2, uh, which and 29.3 and 29.4. And we're going to begin uh, with a presentation from Mr. Libby and Mr. Lintern about the three items uh, taken together. So uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us today, and uh, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll just take a second to get this uh, loaded. Uh, but while we're uh, waiting, um, I want to thank a number of people that have been involved in the preparation of this report. Uh, the Acting Chief Planner, Greg Lintern, Anne-Marie Nasser, and Scott Pennington for the superlative work they've done. Janie Romoff and her team on the parks uh, work. Joe Farag, um, the finance staff, very helpful. Bill Toronto, Mike Whalen in particular, 
uh, and the team from WSP and Macmillan Architects who have assisted us in the engineering study. Uh, what we have for you today, Mr. Mayor, is a uh, four-part four uh, summary of growth and park needs, an update on the implementation strategy, the financial strategy, Section 42 review, and next steps. And uh, you'll know that there's three coordinated reports, this report, the Parkland Strategy, and the Section 42 that are the subject of today's presentation. Over to you, Greg. Mr. Mayor, over the last 10 years, uh, and we've all seen witness to this with the number of cranes that are in the city, the um, amount of development happening downtown is significant uh, difference in the look and feel of our city, and you can see that with these two images. Uh, I'd importantly note out that the density has increased significantly. Uh, the average density over the last uh, 10 or so years has gone from 269 to 682 units a hectare citywide downtown. That is the, uh, an even more intense level of, of development. The, uh, the pace of development is expected to continue over the planning horizon out to 2041, both uh, in the context of residential that we're seeing and non-residential development, you can see the numbers on the screen. I would just point out that this is why we're acting. We're doing a downtown plan, it's called Teal Core, many of you have heard of it. And uh, importantly, to support that growth, we have to bring online more infrastructure to support the quality of life in the city. And one key part of that is the uh, parks and public realm strategy. Uh, just uh, alongside all of this work going on in this growth area downtown is a citywide look at, um, at Parkland through uh, Jeannie Romoff's uh, group in Parks, Forestry and Recreation, the Parkland Strategy, which is a big piece of work that updates work that was done over a decade ago on how much Parkland we need in the city and where it should go. Uh, what's before you today is the first part of that and coming back in 2018 with the final piece. Um, actually looking at an updated methodology of how to measure the appropriate amount of parkland and uh, bringing a much finer grain, a new methodology to understanding how much parkland we need for our residents. This slide just indicates as something that you know by traveling around in the urban fabric that the downtown experiences a much lower level of, uh, of parkland provision in the rest of the city. Uh, it also highlights the fact that it's very hard to acquire land in the, in the downtown. Uh, sites are smaller and they're much, much more expensive than the rest of the city. The parkland strategy uh, uh, includes mapping in the, in, the, in the documents. I just point out that this is a way of understanding that uh, there is a shortage of large parks across the city, but there, are particularly, uh, there is a particular shortage in uh, areas like Young and Eglinton in the downtown. Uh, again, it's not just the amount of parkland, but the size and utility of parkland. The larger the parks are, the greater utility they are to the residents of Toronto. Which brings us to the opportunity for Rail Deck Park. Uh, really, uh, the last remaining, we've done the analysis, it's the last remaining opportunity to provide a large park downtown, uh, would be the largest park outside the parks and open spaces that are actually in the Don Valley. It's an asset really for all Torontonians, accessible to the entire region. We heard previously about a Go RER station. Uh, right at, at this location. Uh, it can make a very positive contribution to the environmental and resiliency goals of the city. It aligns very nicely with a lot of the strategies that this council has advanced. And very importantly, it resets the signature of Toronto. It aligns with our strongest selling point, which is our livability. Uh, the location of Rail Deck Park is, is really nested strategically among major tourist and entertainment destinations in the southern part of the waterfront. It is uh, very well connected and uh, immediately accessible to all, of the, to all of these areas and will in, enhance the, the environment of tourism and, and uh, entertainment in this precinct. Uh, I think in the context of the overall parkland strategy, uh, this will be an essential part of a larger network of connected parks, open space, including uh, cycling uh, and uh, pedestrian networks that are throughout the public realm. It gives us really a missing, part of the missing, uh, a missing tooth of the connections that are across the central waterfront, connecting to the west, to, uh, rail, to uh, the West Toronto Rail Path, connecting to the east up the Don Valley. The project area itself is eight, uh, almost eight and a half hectares, uh, or 20 acres. 
uh, portion of it is owned by Metrolinx at the corner of Front and Spadina. The city, uh, very importantly, owns the, uh, the uh, majority of the lands along the perimeter, both north and south of it, and owns the Pointe de Luz Bridge, which bisects the rail corridor. The property, if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're aware of these parks in other parts of the city, is the best equivalent uh, parks are Christie Pitts and um, Eglinton, uh, Eglinton Park up at Young and Eglinton. The potential of a comprehensive park development is a very important part of this. It is large enough really to serve the breadth and range of purpose that you see here in these seven other downtown parks. So this is a really uh, good way to very strategically and creatively rethink what is now a very single purpose corridor into something that can provide great, much greater utility and function for the residents of Toronto. And of course, the global precedents for Rail Deck Park are there. Many of you may have visited these. Most obvious one is uh, Millennium Park in Chicago, but there are other examples right across the United States and other cities where uh, the imaginative use of public space is what these cities are dealing with. They have to deal more creatively with open space because it is so difficult and so expensive to go out and just buy land. I'll turn it back over to John. As you can see, Mr. Mayor, from this slide, we're between stage gate one and stage gate two, which we'll be working on next year and, and, and into 19. Uh, we're, we've concluded our feasibility and we believe this uh, uh, proposal is more than feasible, that the information's there before you and I'll go through some of that that leads to that conclusion. And we want to lay out what the next steps for uh, development concepts are. We've already completed our planning study and draft official plan amendment uh, that's uh, before uh, Toronto East York and came and will be part of the council meeting on next week. Uh, we have a class, an engineering and class four costing study that accompanies this report. We've done extensive title searching of the rail corridor properties. We have undertaken a preliminary financial analysis of the growth related tools. And we've had a number of public engagement activities, two public meetings, walking tours, interactive workshops, roundtable discussions, online surveys, website launch, and social media activity. And in October last year, we unanimously adored this, this stage one work, and it continues on. Um, the preliminary design concept that you see before you is, uh, is more detailed in the engineering study. The colors indicate the length of the spans of the various uh, links across uh, across the uh, the corridor to pr provide the support for the park. Uh, we've been working with WSP Macmillan Architects and um, it's highly technical in nature. Track level works are designed to minimize impact on the existing rail operations. There are primary and secondary support structures, structures which will be columns and gir giant girders spanning the corridor from north to south. They range in depth from 1.5 to 4.5 meters. Uh, there's major mechanical, electrical, civil engineering uh, systems that will be incorporated into the dec decking structure to support the park use and ensure that there's um, uh, quality environment below the deck structure for the uh, rail corridor. And uh, although it involves some broad assumptions for park use, we've deliberately not done the detailed design work on the park. We will be doing that in the next stage. Uh, and a uh, design competition will be um, undertaken. And uh, I just want to make sure you understand that the slab for the decking structure is supported by hundreds of giant girders around, ranging in these depths, made either steel or precast concrete. Here's a cross section. Um, I want to just make a real point in understanding the elevation issue is uh, really important. This is probably one of the higher parts of the deck. At Spadine, it's almost level. In other portions, it's almost, almost level. But this one shows you uh, the, 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 po the stairs that would be required to go up and then across. And uh, it's also tr important to note that this structure that we've uh, looked at is relatively lightweight in comparison to any structure you would have to build if you were to support buildings. And the columns, obviously, are much narrower for this deck structure than they would be for any um, structure that would um, uh, support buildings if they could find the space in between the tracks. Um, the design allows for a 1.5 meter depth of soil for the trees and uh, any other uh, plant species. And there's acoustic and vibration separation, ventilation systems, et cetera, uh, so as to continue the uh, safety of the rail corridor operations below. Uh, an important point, I think um, somewhat uh, uh, really important for us to consider here is a dotted yellow line around the GO-RER Spadina front uh, station. 
So uh, our uh, Metrolinx are planning a station, and that station uh, will require access from the station, which is that gray area in the middle, up to the surface in some fashion. And the deck, rail deck, if it were you know, the first phase, would provide that easy access from the, sta from the station platform up and over onto Front Street and to uh, Spadina to the east. So we think it's an obvious candidate for integration with Metrolinx and we're working cooperatively with them to see what we can do to have this as a first stage or first phase of the proposal. Um, and then you can see the next phase here is the, that central phase. Although it's not absolutely carved in stone, uh, there's other opportunities, say, for the area east of uh, Spadina over the Blue Jays' ways, but it, that will depend on the financing strategy that we, that we uh, develop over the next little while. Okay, here's the money uh, shot. Um, here's the order of magnitude cost estimates for the 21 acres. Uh, the deck construction itself is about half of it, about $844 million. Uh, of course, this is a class four uh, estimate and it's uh, based on one to 5% design, so there's a fair swing in the design up and down. Uh, park construction, $95 million. Design fees, 95. Contingencies, here we have 330, $327 million in uh, contingencies for design, pricing, construction, and another $304 million of allowances. So we've got $627, $631 million in, in contingencies and allowances here, which we think is a hefty uh, allowance for working in a complicated space. Total is 1.665. And the first uh, phase can be done roughly for $870 million. Um, the financial strategy uh, that we've been working on uh, is really uh, looking at this as an investment to support the future growth of the downtown and the city generally. The financial strategy that we've uh, identified various funding tools as prime uh, candidates for analysis, uh, development charges in conjunction with the upcoming uh, development charge bylaw, a review of Section 42 funding, which I'll go to in a minute, uh, the use of Section 37 more consistently across uh, the, the um, city and the downtown for uh, this purpose, local improvement charges, special levies we've looked at, and we've looked at also value capture tools. And we'll be looking to see if there's some contributions that will be coming from the commercial interest, interests who benefit from the quality of, that this park would provide in their area. Uh, we're specifically going to uh, proactively engage the development community in the appropriate use of DCs, Section 42, Section 37, any other value capture tools. We'll really have to find the sweet spot that meets the city's need for additional parkland and other services in a growing downtown with 140 to 180,000 more units coming to 2041. I'll say that again, 140,000 to 180,000 more units coming into the downtown to 2041. And we have to look at the economics of the, bringing those uh, units to market uh, in an orderly way with the development community. Section 42 review. Um, uh, it is a uh, necessary uh, time for us to take a look at uh, Section 42 again. Uh, we set the alternative rate in 2005 and uh, actually started collecting a little bit later than that. Under the current policy, the alternative is set by the provincial maximum, but we actually don't uh, go up to the provincial maximum. We actually cap the rate at 10% of the value of the land that's in question. So we've, we've got an artificial cap at 10%. We don't have a per unit charge per se. We have this cap. And uh, you can see on the next slide that um, very uh, similar uh, areas in Bloor and Sherburne, Bloor and Young, very uh, similar um, cash and loot contribution, 2.9, 2.7, yet one development has 526 units and the other one has 225, effectively proving that at a certain height you are actually just getting, um, um, there's no additional charge or, or collection made for uh, parkland and that is uh, something we think we'd have to address in this review. And uh, just to emphasize some of the guiding principles that we've put right into the recommendation, um, we're going to proactively consult with the business uh, and development community on funding options. The proposed changes to Section 42 and opportunities to improve the development review process. Uh, we were going to use existing revenues uh, from Rail Deck Park will not negatively impact, will not negatively impact funding available to other parkland priorities across the city. That's the rule in, uh, in terms of engagement. 
and any new revenues identified as part of the strategy will benefit both Rail Deck Park and other parkland priorities across the city. I'll say that one more time. Any revenues identified as part of the strategy will benefit both Rail Deck Park and other parkland priorities across the city. And we believe that the uh, Rail Deck Park can be phased. So the next steps, Mr. Mayor, um, is to uh, uh, adopt a phase two work plan in 2018-2019 with a focus on the following areas, the technical issues, the capital coordination with Metrolinx, the financial strategy that we've laid out in the report with the principles to be adhered to, real estate work to secure the necessary properties, including the air rights along in the, rail, in the rail corridor, and additional public engagement on the design of the park, preliminary uh, program development for the park, fundraising strategy, evaluation of governance op options for long-term operations and maintenance. That concludes our presentation, Mr. Mayor. Thank you uh, very much uh, to uh, Mr. Linter, Mr. Libby, uh, and your team. Um, I'm going to suggest we follow a pattern that we followed before, which is to uh, hear the deputants. There's only two. Uh, and then we can have the panel come back here and answer questions, but we'll be in full possession of all the comments that we've got from the uh, public and from, uh, and from our uh, staff on the uh, report, uh, if that's agreeable to everybody. And so on that note, I'll ask Mr. Wilson, Hamish Wilson, to come forward and offer his deputation. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm a bit conflicted because, of course, this uh, is appealing and it makes some sense to uh, boost the parkland. Everything south of Front Street, uh, when the city was first established, uh, was supposed to be for uh, uh, a public uh, park. And obviously it didn't happen. We were thoroughly sold out because we really don't have that large uh, or linear park space yet. Uh, and so uh, I'm agnostic as well as whether or not it should be built over for housing because we need more housing, even though there's a lot being, uh, being built. But I'm especially anxious about mm, continuing a, a process of sellout and failure to, prov you know, we're, we're, we need more transit. If we build on this linear corridor that city owned from Bathurst to Spadina, I think we're failing the future again, and we've been doing it for a while. We need to build more transit. Uh, we need to have relief for King, relief for Queen, relief for Go, relief for the Bluer, we relief for the Gardener, relief for the Lakeshore. The only way we're going to do that is to build more transit, effective transit, not milk run transit along the lakefront that services the linear uh, destinations of the lakefront, but direct into the core uh, transit. And this is what's inspiring me. This 1985, West, uh, you know, the, the downtown relief line in its fullness, not just this small little bit that's purported as a relief line now, but the full thing. And I honestly think that we need the West End more than we do the, uh, the East because of the RER and Smart Track and potential for actually exploring different surface options, including using the Gardener and the, the uh, or not the Gardener, the Don Valley. So this, this particular section, we need the width. If, if, if land is precious for parks, it's even more precious for linear corridors for transit. So by building over it and constraining it, I think we are probably doing the wrong thing. Uh, and I've had a recent idea of something doing something differently, which is actually to have a, uh, taking uh, uh, the queue from the Jarvis reversible uh, lane, lane to do a reversible transit way starting from the pinch point at the base of High Park because everything west of the High Park pinch point, much of the west of the High has to come through into the core and we need that direct route in. I think everybody would love to have a fast trip. So having a reversible transit way that comes in, jogs to the south end of, uh, jogs to the south to get across the rail tracks to touch base with the uh, Touch Touch Exhibition in Ontario Place, comes back over, comes along uh, the, you know, from Dufferin East, and then the, the uh, get, get to the north side of the tracks uh, east of Strawn, although I think we've built upon that, unfortunately, and really constrained that, and then into the core. That's what we need. It's easy to do a, reverse, a reversibility here because there's a loop. We can send the vehicles back by king and queen. So uh, that's what's really bothering me. We, we have to keep our options open for transit, and I think we're shutting them closed again, which is really unfortunate. Uh, once again, because it's the cars that are causing the transit, by the way. Uh, Mr. Gardner said, oh, there is no mystery about what has caused the problem. Uh, it's cars, cars, cars. So if we actually had a car-free downtown, we have more park space uh, throughout by uh, having fewer parking spaces. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Questions of the deputant? Okay, well, thank you very much. And the second uh, de de deputant is Mitch uh, Gascoigne. <coughs>
morning, sir. You have three minutes, and uh, thank you for coming. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mitch Gascoigne. I'm the Vice President of Development for Centre Court, and I'm here to offer my support for the Rail Deck Park. Uh, Centre Court is a leading high-rise residential developer in the City of Toronto, and we're currently one of the most active developers in the city with 5,000 homes and $1.5 billion of development in uh, process or recently completed. As a leading developer in the city, we not only take pride in the positive impact that our developments have on the owners and the greater community, but we also strive to actively invest and participate in positive initiatives within the city. We're, we're incredibly impressed with the vision for Rail Deck Park and want to lend our full support behind this incredible project. The Rail Deck Park uh, project represents a bold and creative solution to the many challenges of city building and a solution to managing the rapid development of our city. The proposed plan to develop an innovative structure over a working rail corridor to support a vibrant and dynamic urban park is a fantastic bit of creativity and it's the type of big thinking that gets us excited to live in this fantastic city. Our projects, on our projects we currently pay uh, cash and loot to parkland and a lot of times we're paying between three and five million dollars per project and we never see where that money goes. And for us, this is a fantastic use of those funds in, uh, in a large scale solution such as Rail Deck. Based on Toronto's astounding pace of growth, we see a strong need for improvement and investment in the city's public realm and park space. As a forward-thinking company, we are excited to offer our full support for this proposal. We believe that the development of this park space will be essential for improving the quality of life for Torontonians moving forward, and we think that uh, it will be a beautiful, beautiful civic space for people to play, relax, uh, build community, and connect in our great city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gasquin. Are there questions of the deputy? We thank you very much for taking the time to come. Much appreciated. Uh, okay, so we can then revert back to questions of staff on the presentation or any other questions that people have, and I have Councillor Cressy to start. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll direct this to our Deputy City Manager, Mr. Libby. Uh, as part of the development of this report, uh, I understand that city staff partnered with Build to, to do an analysis of the structural and uh, technical viability of this project. What is the outcome of that, and can it work alongside a rail corridor running below? So, Mr. Mayor, we did a detailed uh, engineering uh, and architectural study of the structure that would be required to put the deck in place. Our consultants have uh, showed the feasibility of this in technical terms. We've had extensive discussions with the rail companies and others to ensure that we can, uh, in, an, in, an, in an active ra rail corridor, place the columns where we've suggested. We'll continue to have uh, active uh, discussions with them. Uh, so bottom line, based on our structural and technical analysis, this can be built? Yes, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion as it relates to Rail Deck Park regarding the ownership air rights. As part of this report, more than a year's work has gone into a full title search. Can you go through who the four owners are of the air rights above the rail corridor? Mr. Mayor, the four owners are the Toronto Terminal Railways, the CN, City of Toronto and uh, Metrolinx. All right. Now, as it relates to the, the land use designations, I understand there is a concurrent report that's being brought forward um, to Council through TYCC regarding uh, an official plan amendment. What does that, in effect, do if that official plan amendment is passed at Council? That, Mr. Mayor, uh, would have the effect of designating the area for the Rail Deck Park. Uh, so it would maintain the designation as parks and open space? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. All right. The, the funding strategy, which the detailed funding strategy has been identified as moving into the next phase of this project, but the principle I've heard you speak to in your presentation is that growth pays for growth. Uh, as it relates to Section 42 and the principle of parkland growth paying for parkland growth, are we under collecting in Section 42 as a city? Um, Mr. Mayor, if you look at the report that we've presented to you, you can see that uh, we're not capturing enough parkland, nor in a way that fairly represents the value that's being created uh, by the properties. Now, in order to increase the Section 42 rates, do we, are we required to have a parks plan in place, be it through TO Core for downtown or citywide? Mr. Mayor, that's correct. So. Uh, as part of TO Core, a parks plan will be coming forward. At that time, would that be the appropriate moment, moment to increase the Section 42 rate for the downtown? Mr. Mayor, that's, that is the appropriate time. All right. And as part of that, with the reallocation of the rate, is there a proposal to change the distribution between 
uh, the local ward, 50%, the citywide, 25%, and the district, 25%, or would that maintain? Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, we've made great pains in the recommendations to say the existing scheme, the monies collected on the existing scheme, apply the same way, and in the same case, on a future, we're going to look for a scheme that distributes uh, monies so as to distribute it across the city. So last question then. Uh, by virtue of increasing the Section 42 rate as part of TO Core for the downtown to help pay for Rail Deck Park, this would also increase the amount of money to pay for new parkland across the city at the same time. That's, that's the object, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Cressy. Uh, other, uh, Jan Councillor Nunziata. Thank you. Uh, just on the uh, cost estimate, um, design fees, uh, 95 and then you have design and pricing. So tell me what the difference is uh, on the design fees. Design fees 95 million and then you have design and pricing 327. Let me just get the contingency. Uh, the first is the actual estimate of the design fees. On and slide then, 20, yeah, on slide 20. The first number is a number that's the actual cost of the soft cost, the design fees. The other one is a contingency for any design costs that may be unanticipated. It's a contingency. Oh, okay. So it's not, okay. Um, to, just, to, just a question on the financial strategy. Um, so right now, um, Councillor Councilor McMahon, I, I'm sorry, I just can't see. Okay, sorry. Um, the section 42, section 37, so all the, all, all the existing development that's happened downtown with the downtown councillors in the last few years, there's a reserve account now that uh, that um, money has been allocated to. So just uh, will all that money in the reserve account now be, um, be uh, allocated to this project? Mr. Mayor, no. Uh, the money that's in the existing reserve accounts in the four districts will go to the four districts as we as intended as the formula applies so there will be no change to the existing formula for the existing amounts in the reserve accounts thank you thank you uh, councilor nunziata councilor davis um i just wanted to ask about the parkland acquisition uh, or the parkland strategy report um so this report is coming in the new year <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, this report will be coming in uh, towards the end of Q2. Final report. Okay. And it infers there, there already is a new methodology for looking at um, the parkland demand in the city. Where, where is Janie? I hear her voice. But I'm here. Don't see. <laughs> ah, behind Councillor Burnside. <laughs> Okay, there I'll try and move over. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've already developed this methodology and you're in the process of applying it to, to you, uh, Mr. Mayor. There's a draft methodology that is uh, outlined in this phase one of the report yeah. that looks at a more finite uh, approach around how we assess parkland provision across the city. Uh, we'll be using this draft methodology in phase two to come up with the conclusions around uh, how it should be applied across the city and the new uh, approach around parkland provision. And that those conclusions will come in the report in the second quarter? That's correct, but the so. initial report that you have before you does have an outline of what that methodology uh, is being proposed. Right, but, I'm, but the results of the application of the methodology are coming in the spring and we will have a new set of priorities for parkland acquisition? Through, through you, Mr. Mayor, I, you know, I can say that the assessment that they've done to date um, certainly um, um, elaborates on the parkland uh, deficiencies that we have across the city and updates it with, uh, you know, the updated population data as well. So where we know there have been parkland deficiencies is more, more even uh, acute uh, from the update that they're doing in the report. The methodology, the biggest change in the methodology uh, that they're proposing uh, looks at more finite um, census dissemination cells, if you be it, connected to it rather than the old LPAC provision which big, we were using. Big areas. That big areas, that's correct. So it's, it's smaller areas, 
Uh, and instead of using the, uh, you know, uh, if you would say as the crow flies approach, uh, it looks at connectivity uh, within a five to 10 minute walking distance within that smaller uh, provision. So uh, I, would, I would suggest uh, through this report that it creates uh, a much more walkable connection based approach to looking at uh, where parkland is needed and is accessible throughout the city. And then there will be an investment strategy? So through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the parkland strategy is, is a requirement uh, under the Planning Act, uh, uh, certainly to be part of the official plan. So the investment strategy would be the same as the approach that we use now in collecting parkland uh, revenue uh, through our acquisition reserves and then through the planning process in collaboration with planning as parcels become available we would then assess them the same way we do now and look to those reserves around the affordability of, of that space. It's been a thank little you. ad hoc. No, that, that, that was actually your last question. Okay. Okay. Just, uh, thank you very much. You Mr. Mayor just might add that certainly in high growth areas will be a, a focus as we go through uh, studies in Young and Eglinton downtown the centers and the avenues knowing that more people are arriving in those areas with a focus on an update of parkland strate strategies and looking very opportunistically at those opportunities in those study areas to achieve new parks. Okay, are there any other uh, members of city council here, not members of the committee wishing to ask questions? Uh, seeing none, it would be a uh, time to move then to members of the committee with questions. Councillor Pasternak first, Councillor Plasio, do I see your hand up? Councillor thank Ainsley. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm looking at recommendations under uh, item 29.4. Um, I don't see any uh, asks of the provincial governments for amendments to the Planning Act. Can we do all of this without amendments to the Planning Act? Here, Mr. Mayor, yes. Uh, when it comes to, I guess I'm on page 10 of the report, um, mentioned section 42 as we're talking about cash and lieu. Now, it's my experience with the planning staff that they're pushing harder and harder for on-site parkland dedication, which would actually erase section 42 revenue flows. Is there, are, are, are is, is there a, are they talk, are you talking with our planning department? Because that's a trend I'm seeing where they'd like to see a parkland dedication on site which would erase the revenue flow of, of section 42 funds. Through, through you, Mr. Or Mayor. Or reduce it. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we're certainly um, advancing where we can on site parkland dedication. Um, the issue that we're having is increasingly developments occurring on smaller and smaller sites and the um, appropriateness of taking smaller and smaller parks gets called into question. So at some point, uh, certainly we're seeing it in Young and Eglinton and other, and other centers. Um, we know in the downtown, for example, that 90% of the sites are less than one hectare in size. So the ability to take a good functional open space for parks purposes is increasingly limited. Uh, and it's why we're turning to other, uh, other ideas for uh, assembling uh, catch and loo funds uh, it's more strategically in growth areas to, uh, to develop parks. Now, when it comes to securing Section 42 or cash and lieu from downtown developments, um, often um, those funds are previously allocated to other projects uh, in, in the downtown core as they are across the city. Are we counting dollars twice here where we might be expecting certain dollars for the rail deck park, but in fact, the local councillor has other uh, park uh, capital plans underway and that's when you start digging deep that a few years before he had already or she had already pledged those funds to, to another project. So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we aren't uh, recommending through this report or any report coming forward as Mr. Livy has indicated, any changes to the existing, uh, as we call first 5%, which is the reserve funds that we have that are allocated through our 10 year capital plan. So there is no changes to the allocation of those funds that's suggested. Um, what we are suggesting through changes to, to section 42 to the alternate rate uh, would suggest some different spending patterns that would have to be spent locally. So if, if we remember the alternate rate, 
is, is uh, a group of funds that stays within the area that they've been generated and aren't included in those reserve funds that, that you're speaking to. So we're confident that there isn't any uh, as, you know, double, double counting of, of the funds as we're moving forward. And one of the arguments for this project uh, advanced by downtown councillors uh, is that um, there's park deficiency in the downtown core, and certainly when you walk around, you can see that. But they're not really counting our waterfront as, as a park, yet, in fact, waterfront property is run by the Parks Department, and many do consider it a park. Is that, is, is that a correct assumption? Are we including the waterfront so through you, Mr. Uh, Final we, question. When we properly calculate park deficiency? In the, in the parkland provision analysis that's been conducted, uh, we do use the waterfront parks as part of the parkland uh, analysis. Uh, the only park that is not considered a part of that analysis is the Toronto Island Park, and that's because of the accessibility uh, on, a, on a ferry boat rather than, you know, a walkable or, or sort of public transit accessibility. So if we... Uh, no, that, that was it. Uh, sorry, Councillor. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Try, though. Yeah, Councillor Cressy snuck one in there and uh, asked him what had happened if uh, he scored a goal after the hockey period was over, but I didn't ask him that, uh, whether it would count or not. Uh, Councillor uh, Palacio is next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In terms of uh, the financial strategy, is this project going to be paid by taxpayers from the property tax base in any way? Mayor, the emphasis has been on growth-related strategy, so we're looking at growth-related tools. We do think that there's some contributions that can be made by businesses or others that might be interested in supporting the concept. We've had recent indications from the Blue Jays they're interested in assisting us in uh, seeing the park realized, but uh, the primary object is to have growth pay for growth. So if we have these commercial contrib uh, contributions or um, offers from the Blue Jays, is there a dollar amount? Not at this point, Mr. Mayor. Not at this point. Now, on October, the uh, October 2016, when City Council adopted the Rail Deck uh, Park and the official plan and implementation strategy, there was a motion that either is uh, Council by law or myself put it forward, and it had to do with the, with the Green Line implementation strategy along the hydro lands. What's happening with that part of the report? Why that part is not anywhere, or at least I'm, I don't know if I'm missing it. If I am, please. Um. Uh, maybe I can uh, start and maybe supplement by uh, Ms. Roma. The, uh, the, uh, the idea is very much in our mind's eye with the conceptualization of the Rail Duck Park to date. As I explained in our, in our presentation, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the idea of improving connectivity east and west, uh, which includes uh, attaching uh, to open space systems and, and bike networks to the west through uh, the West Toronto Rail Path. Uh, you can see from our uh, presentation material a reference as well in northwest to the Green Line. Uh, actually, through TO Core in the entire uh, Parks and Public Realm strategy, there is the idea in our draft downtown plan, which has been to Council, that looks at the encircling of the downtown through the Don Valley, across up through Davenport, attaching to Green Line and back through. So it, there, is a, there is a very strong uh, reference to- A section of, uh, thank you, a section of Ward 17 and Ward 18 is part of the downtown, and that's part of the, and we are parkland deficient, and that's being acknowledged by council, and also in your slide number seven the, of your presentation. So it's, I'm just uh, wondering why are we just being left behind all residents in these areas? That can you just please uh, again, understand I think, that? You know, I think uh, the, the plan that we produced so far, the draft downtown plan, looks at the downtown, but also builds up the connectivity of the downtown parks and public realm plan to adjacent areas, north, west, and east, and to those developing networks of public space, including the Green Line and the West Toronto Rail Path. That uh, was your last question. Thanks. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Ainsley, next. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mayor Tory. Um, Mr. Olivia, in the, in the slide deck, it mentioned um, title search. And are there any issues around that, or have they all been dealt with? I know there's some concerns, or there's some musings in the media that different developers already owned air rights over that area or had an agreement to buy them. So, Mr. Mayor, we have an application um, 
uh, submitted by an agent for the TTR as a company that presumably has some sort of conditional offer of purchase and sale. We've not been able to um, uh, see that offer of purchase and sale, so we don't know the, the terms and conditions that they pur purported that they are about to acquire air rights. Um, and I would just say that air rights are, you know, um, are fundamentally different than free and unencumbered uh, land in the downtown. We're aware of that and we're, we're proceeding to uh, advance and uh, report on the um, application that's been made. We'll be doing that in the next quarter. Okay, and then um, much like land, can we expropriate air rights? Uh, through you, we Mr. Came Mayor, down to that is um, I think the object would be to secure the air rights through an amicable negotiation and I wouldn't want to speculate on a future options for the city in that regard. Okay, and is there more than one issue around air rights with one developer, or is this just the only one you're expecting? We're only, we're only aware of the TTR having the air rights in, on title, and this application has been made by this other company acting as their agent, so that's, those are the two parties that we're aware of at this time. Okay, and, um, okay, thank you. And then, um, so for, I had a question for, I guess, Janie Romoff or one of your staff. I was around the, at the beginning of the presentation where it talked about the amount of park space that the average person needed or that the area needed and 10.8 meters and 28 meters squared. Is that, a, I guess, an, an industry average or that's something that we determined at the city that's appropriate? Is it best practice or how? So through, How do we get at those numbers? Through you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, there's no such thing as an industry average per se. Our consultants have done a lot of work reaching out to other large urban centers to see how Toronto compares uh, when it comes to square meters per person, which is a measurement that's used uh, quite commonly. So as, as uh, if you look to slide uh, six, um, it does speak to the average at 28 square meters per person and then 10 square meters per person in the downtown study area, which is quite different. If you look at comparisons uh, across large North American urban centers, uh, especially in high density areas such as downtown, it does speak to Vancouver being a comparable amount of parkland uh, square meters per person. But, uh, you know, comparing to cities like New York, Chicago, and Houston, we have significantly less amount of parkland, uh, especially in the highest density areas of the city. So the work does point out that Toronto, specifically in highly dense areas such as the downtown, uh, does not compare favorably to other large urban centers from a parkland provision perspective. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Tory. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bylaw. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask staff to bear with me because I have questions that go all over the place. <laughs> so um, what is uh, your definition of the downtown for the purpose of the collection of Section 42? Is it Bathurst, uh, the east, uh, is it like the downtown core, TO core boundaries? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, you gave us an example of the uh, Section 42 for a, a building of 200 and something units and another one of 500 units. Can you give us an example of, for example, a homeowner that is doing a triplex? Through, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm hoping I'm correct, but a triplex as an example, if it was a already a triplex, and was being renovated as a triplex, there no, would not be it, any it's parkland new, dedication. New, if it, they're adding the increased units. units, then that would kick in the, the parkland dedication requirement. And how much is it? So, so a per unit, it will be even higher than these, correct? Uh, for a triplex? I don't know. It's based on the value. It would be based on, hang on, we'll, we'll get you. It would be based on the value of the land. So you would basically look at the size of the parcel, and then you would look at the amount that the triplex, the density of the triplex, and then you would basically determine the value of the land, and then that would be that. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be at, of the, uh, at the same level that we've indicated in the example in the report. Okay. So we can I, I, go I back. Just, we can go back and find you, that number I just, for you. I, I think there's there's something here aside from this issue. I just had somebody coming and saying that for a triplex they had indices and park levies. They were asked $100,000 from the City of Toronto. 
huge disincentive to do anything as a homeowner. And that's what I'm, I was trying to get some numbers from you because I think there's another issue that we might need to deal with with this, with this section 42. Um, you said uh, uh, that you are going to ensure that the distribution happens to the rail deck and to the other areas that need green space. How are you going to ensure that to happen? Well, Mr. Mayor, in the report, we were, took great pains, and you'll see in the recommendation, to say that future revenues will benefit all parts of the city, including rail deck, that it won't be an either or. And in particular, we're going to focus on those areas that are parkland deficient, where there's clearly additional need that's going to be required and also in consideration of the future growth that we're getting and that's factored in. But that is the condition, that's the terms of engagement for this moving forward. Okay. Um, last time this report was put into place, as Councillor Palacio said, we had requested, there was a motion put in to have this report coming back to Council in 2017 with the green line and the rail deck opportunities for connections, including feasibility and funding options. These projects have been in our books for decades. We asked last time that the rail deck came that there was a great opportunity to connect these projects that are greening the communities. We asked for a feasibility study and funding options. Why aren't we getting that? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think this is work that is on our agenda. We've been focusing on this phase one of the rail deck park as a first priority. I think when we report back uh, with the next phase of this, we can certainly uh, move to some more detailed work on that. Once we solidify some of the partnerships and lease agreements with the various partners that are involved. So it isn't a project that we're not working on at all, but we haven't uh, gotten it to that level of detail yet. That was your I will move the motion again, just to make well, you, sure. You, yeah, when we get to that time, I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you will do that, and, and uh, I'm sure you'll get some support on that. Uh, we had Councillor Shiner to ask questions. So I guess through you, Mayor, to Mr. Livy. Costs per acre of Rail Deck Park compared to the cost per acre of land downtown if we were to acquire it. Well, Mr. Mayor, it's, I'll say first it's apples and oranges, and then I'll try and bring the two together. So unencumbered I, I know land, we couldn't find a site that I'm big, sorry. but unencumbered we want land, to let, uh, yeah. Unencumbered land is somewhere between 95 and $110 million an acre which is in the downtown. We're finding that on an ongoing basis. We have re real live examples of that. It also includes a whole bunch of things around contamination and cleaning up those sites, but that's, that's what we do on, on, those la on those lands. Difficult to find. Rail Deck Park, if you work it up per acre, it's about $83 million an acre, and it's mostly about structure and the construction, and included in that is an allowance for air rights. Thank you. Go RER station integ integration, working with Metrolinks can't be easy. And no disrespect to Metrolinks, but it's a very technical amount of work. What resources are we going to be um, using to try and work through the technical problems of building a park or a deck over the train station and be able to convince them to allow us to do that in that first phase so, Mr. Mayor, our existing budget provides us with engineering and technical expertise. We're also asking for uh, support in that previous report on Smart Track for the RER program. We believe we'll have enough technical expertise to bring to the table, and certainly the work we've done to date informs our work, and it becomes very obvious that the rail deck opportunity over the Metrolink Spadina station is an obvious first phase for us. So, when Councillor Bylaw was asking questions about impact of section 42 on grade related housing uh, I have the same question when it comes back to both the parks plan and section 42 which is the type of consultation that we're going to be doing with the folks that are in the industry and actually build the housing to make sure that the impact of our decisions still allow us to create affordable housing yet get a fair amount and a fair uh, a contribution towards the need for parkland and to discuss with them and understand with them, and they understand us, what we need and what they need, so there's that partnership as we go forward. What's the intent of the consultation that we're gonna have on those two issues? Mr. Mayor, those are those sentiments that you've just expressed are indeed ones that we share as staff. We've gotta look at the suite of tools that we have, adapt and, and talk to them about what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, where the price pro points on our pro forma are, what are our price points on, developing in the downtown are, and we're gonna to have to see that the full suite of 
uh, tools are used, including our end-to-end uh, -end development review to see if we can improve timelines because that time is, time is money. So the question was, besides understanding what we have to do, are we going to be sitting down with industry folks to try and work that out and get that understanding? Final question. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Councillor Shiner. Uh, other speakers, I have Councillor McMahon. Oh, yes, Councillor Burns, I was next. Councillor McMahon after that. Sorry. Apparently. Um, uh, thank you. Through you, I believe uh, this deputy, to the Deputy uh, City Manager that you just mentioned that the uh, in the contingency and allowances, that in those funds are included for uh, purchasing of air rights? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next time you report back is when? It's going to be 2019, first quarter. Or 2019. There, and at uh, that point, it will, we, is that a 30% design? No. Uh, we'll report back on all our findings on acquiring air rights on technical and other considerations. We'll be getting along in the design, but um, the funding strategy is in, going to be in session for us, and we're going to have to primarily focus on that part of the exercise. So when's the fine, the, okay, at 30% design, is that when we sort of, is that when you would sort of have a, a very accurate assessment of the cost of this? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that gives us a much better, ac uh, an accurate uh, costing, um, much less variation in the, uh, in the numbers. Okay, and when would you anticipate that, or do we have an, in do we anticipate that at any? In 2019, Mr. Mayor, that's when we expect. 2019, okay. And then, uh, and when does the financial strategy come in? I would assume it's at that 30% design. Well, it, would, it would be preferable if we have to, we'll do it separately, but we'd prefer to do them together. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Burnside. Uh, Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much. Um, so through you, Mr. Mayor, it was mentioned in the presentation that uh, this, and you often don't hear this, but it was it was uh, mentioned today, that this um, strategy for Rail Deck Park, this this plan, uh, is uh, in accordance with our environmental and our resiliency uh, goals of the city. And I just wondered if anyone could elaborate on that beautiful phrase. For you, Mr. Mayor, yes, the intent is for the Rail Deck Park is to um, make it a showcase for around resiliency and green, and, and that has to basically be embedded in the initial design, and that would be our objective because a park of this size in the downtown could accommodate and um, really be forward-thinking in that respect. So would you have any examples or specifics of what it could possibly do? or what, what kind of measures we could incorporate in, into the project to, to make it a, an environmental show, showpiece? Um, yes, through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, we are looking at basically um, making sure that there's um, significant tree canopy in the area. We would be optimizing the wet weather flow and looking at naturalized areas. Um, there's been some really interesting examples in uh, Millennial Park and even some of the newer parks because Millennium is actually a bit dated. Um, so there is new technologies that we would be looking at in terms of stormwater runoff. I would add also, Mr. Mayor, that Sugar and Common that has been constructed in the city includes a stormwater management system uh, already integrated into the park design. And, and probably continue with our pollinator protection strategy and, and permeable pavers, things like that. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. That's incorporated into all of the parkland development approaches that we're taking. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. And then when was our, um, when did we last review our section 32 rate, or 42 rate? That was in uh, two, 2003. 2003. And then it came forward into force in 2005. Okay well before my time. Um, and so we are going to bring that back in Q2 of uh, next year, 2018. We'll be bringing forward the 42 related to where we have a park plan aligned with the 42. So we'll be able to bring forward the new 42 regime in um, the Teal Core area and the Young Eglinton area. And once the parkland strategy is completed, we can then bring forward a citywide section 42 change. Right. And um, 
That will go to uh, planning and growth versus parks? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And um, is there, is, can you discuss um, the, the industry standard for walkability uh, to uh, your local park? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, as noted in the draft report that we have, industry is moving more towards a walkability uh, score or factor when you're looking at parkland accessibility. And five to 10 minutes is a standard that's used by many uh, large North American cities. And, and how we do it, how's Toronto doing with that? We're just doing that measurement now through the new uh, methodology. So I think we can report back on that fully uh, when the, the next phase of the parkland strategy comes forward. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councilor McMahon. Uh, I have no other speakers listed at the moment, no other uh, people to question staff listed at the moment, so if, uh, if I don't uh, see any others, then we can move on to uh, speakers. And uh, I would start by asking if, uh, okay, <laughs> Councilor Cressy, over to you. Hi, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, let me begin by thanking our staff across departments for all their exceptional work, uh, as well as you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is a project that I think speaks to leadership and vision in a city, in planning for a city for tomorrow, and I want to thank you for all your hard work. Uh, great cities do invest in their future. That's what great cities do. Great cities plan for 50 years from now, 25 years from now, not today. And Rail Deck Park is such a moment. It is about the future. And just as we need for our future to invest in affordable housing and transit, so too must we invest in social infrastructure to make everything livable. These are not nice-to-haves, rather they are part of the essential mix for a great city like ours. Uh, for our local community in downtown, a community that has doubled in population in 15 years and will double again in population in the next 25 to a half a million people, and a community that is already the most parks-deficient area in the entire city, Rail Deck Park is indeed critical and necessary for livability. I think that is, is clearly understood simply by the numbers. But this is not about downtown. This is about a citywide project for the future. It is about a destination adjacent to the Air Canada Centre, adjacent to the Sky Dome and the Aquarium. Uh, it's Toronto's citywide central park, and it will be. The Scarborough Zoo is not the Scarborough Zoo, it is Toronto Zoo. The downtown CN Tower is not the downtown tower, it is Toronto CN Tower, and that's what Rail Deck Park is about. In New York City, when they opened the High Line, it became and is today the second most popular destination in all of New York after the Empire State Building. After Chicago built Millennium Park, a similar project to this, it quickly became and is today the sixth most popular destination in the entire United States. Neither of those are beside a ballpark or a CN Tower. The opportunity here is to invest in our collective future. Is there a big cost that's being identified? You bet. But the principle here, as our Deputy City Manager has outlined, is that growth will and should pay for growth. That is how you build a city. And if we are under collecting in our park acquisition funds today through Section 42, as we've heard, then we must increase them. And by increasing the rates, not only do we help to build Rail Deck Park, in fact, you help to build more parks across the entire city. That is how you rise a tide to lift all boats. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you have to build the city you want. You have to think, you have to imagine the future and then go out and build it. And to those who would say, we shouldn't build parks, we should build affordable housing. You know what? We must build both. To those who say, we shouldn't build parks, we should build, build transit. You know what? We should build both. If you want to build a great city, you invest in it, and it's time to do just that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Cressy. Other uh, speakers from Council uh, that are not members of the committee that wish to speak? Okay, uh, seeing none, then I would move to the members of the committee wishing to speak. <clears throat> uh, Councillor McMahon. Thank you very much, and I think we've... Uh uh, said it all before as to why this is an important initiative for the city and you, you s saw it in the first few slides where you see the uh, deficit of green space downtown and I wish Councillor Pasternak were here because um, if he's worried about green space downtown he's counting the uh, um, waterfront 
not all the waterfront is green space. Uh, you know, there's a chunk of it that's industrial. So, uh, I mean, we'd be happy to take Earl Bales downtown, relocate it, but that's not going to happen. Um, so I just, you know, we don't want to be mm -hmm. divisive with this um, fantastic initiative because it benefits the whole city, um, especially uh, revisiting our Section uh, 42 funding and um, and also that we we all need to get out outside of our wards and our areas and encourage our residents to yeah, do yeah, so to true. enjoy park uh, parkland and uh, um, other activities but green space in other areas and I encourage everyone to come down and swim in our beautiful beach um, in the summer and visit our winter stations in the beach in, in the winter uh, because this is your city it's not the ward boundaries are really specifically for, for us as councillors um, and for, you know, during elections, uh, minus Section 37, Councillor <laughs> Davis. And, um, and so I'd encourage you to get out and explore your city, but this will be a destination uh, park. Um, it'll be a great space for um, people who work downtown but live elsewhere to visit. It'll be a great uh, space to showcase our uh, Transform TO um, climate change adaptation mitigation plan uh, with special features that we should all be adapting in, in uh, renewing our parks and, and building. And we know the industry standard is about 10 minutes for a, a resident to walk from their home to, to a park, to a green space. And, and that is vital for many reasons, for quality of life, uh, for your dogs, your kids, but for, for health. And there's, you know, there's no price tag on your, your, your health for spiritual, mental, and physical health. So it's, it's the right thing to do for everyone, for one city, which is Toronto. So we love your support. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Mann. I didn't reset the clock, so she was <clears throat> finished in six minutes, and she was finished before that. So thank you. And uh, next we have uh, Councilor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, Mayor Tory. I'm going to be supporting the, the recommendations in this report. And one of the things that I always reflect upon being a city councilor from Scarborough, and you saw the diagram earlier about the amount of, the amount of green space that we have in Scarborough. And often uh, when I'm at events that we hold in our local parks and people come out from downtown Toronto and they ooh and ah over the green space in Scarborough. And then more often than not, they say they come over to me, it's like, you know, councilor, I live in downtown Toronto and I wish we had green space like this. I wish we had more room for playgrounds and splash pads and, and biking facilities and trails. And, um, and I agree with them. I, I think back to when I, when I was first elected and I worked here previously for another city councillor as I watched the, the development take place in downtown Toronto. And there was a mindset then that people were going to move to downtown Toronto, they were going to buy a condo, uh, eventually they would have children and they'd move to the suburbs. And we've reached a point where people are staying downtown, they're enlarging their condos. I know people that have children, they're more than one child, they're in a two bedroom condominium, their kids are in bunk beds and they don't have any green space, there's, there's no splash pads, they're coming out to Scarborough, which I appreciate, but then I hear comments from other people that, that come into the city and they look at the rail lands and they refer to it as a trench. Uh, I had somebody recently say to me, you know, it's, you've got a big ditch running through the down, middle of your downtown core with railroad tracks. And I think this project covering that area over, providing green space, the opportunities, um, you know, I look at Central Park in New York City and what was done there and the amenities that are there. And there's a tremendous oppor opportunity here uh, to provide those amenities that people are looking for the, and to make our uh, down core, downtown core space an even more livable and viable area than it already is. And I'll be supporting the recommendations in this report. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Ainsley. Uh, Deputy Mayor Barlow. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, um, I think um, we have a great city building project in front of us. Um, there's no question the numbers don't lie of how much park deficiency we are in this part of the city. Um, but I think we need to be careful as we present this to our city because, again, I've seen too many projects that when the champions are no longer in this building, 
the project just all of a certain of a sudden starts dying down. And I have, you know, examples over and over again. And we what we need to do is that the city continues to push whoever is around at City Hall for this project. This this needs to be a city project. People need to to feel like they have access to it. It doesn't matter if they live in the West End, it doesn't matter if they live in the East End, it doesn't matter if they live in the downtown. This is a project that they will have access to, that will improve the quality of life. And I have a motion, yes. <laughs> the quality of life. And for that is, so, is, is the reason why I'm pushing so hard for the projects that we have had in the books for a long time that should, be, should have been moving a lot quicker, that actually connect, feed right into this park, where people from the West End, the north of the city, the East End, can actually just cycle and, and walk and run and use it as a park and come and take advantage of what this will be a great city building park. So I think we cannot separate these projects. We need to bring the city together and create this amazing parking park network. And for that, we not only need the Rail Deck Park, but we need to move simultaneously at the same time with the same tools on these other projects. So that's what I'm asking that, that it happens. So the next time we have this project in front of us, we have a little bit more work done by our staff to make sure that we have projects that have been a long time in the books, a long time waiting for negotiations with Hydro, for negotiations with Metrolinx, for money to come, for this to happen. If we're at the table with Metrolinx talking about Real Duck Park, let's make sure we're talking about the West Toronto Rail Path. If we need to talk to Hydro about Real Duck Park, let's make sure we're talking about Greenlight. Let's make sure we create this network. Let's make sure every citizen in every part of the city feels like this is their project and they can have access to it. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Barlow. I could ask a question of the mover as to whether there's any particular information you have that would indicate that you're worried that the champion for Rail Deck Park might not be in the building in the near future, but I won't ask that question. Uh, I heard that and I was immediately kind of thinking, was there something Ms. he knows? Mr. I don't know. anyway, Mayor, unless you're Superman no, no, and no, can no, deliver no, no. this project in four years, we're going to need a I champion for this project probably right. for the next 15 to 20 okay. years. That's okay. what we need. Uh, did you have a question of the mover, Councillor Robinson? Yes, please. I just want, uh, Councillor Bailao, I just want to understand, because I'm having struggles as uh, Councillor Matlow and Carmichael Greber are having struggles at Young and Eglinton because there's no green space. In fact, there's not a blade of grass and it's getting worse. So I'm just, I'm just curious about your motion. Uh, I didn't know it was coming. Is it to ensure these things happen in your ward? Uh, uh, or do these somehow connect? I'm not familiar. Yeah, so, so the West Toronto Rail Path right now um, exists in my ward, but it's, it's actually meeting Councillor Layton, Councillor Cressy's ward. The green line exists in Councillor Palacio's ward and my ward, it's kind of the boundary. It's gonna go all the way to Councillor Matlow. That's the point, it's actually create this network. One is east, the green line is east-west. Uh, the West Toronto Rail Path is supposed to move north also to Councillor Nunziata's ward, but we need to do the work. And it's been on the, on the books for a long time to expand these networks, to expand along all these neighbourhoods and these areas so that the Green Line could eventually get to, you know, your neck of the woods and your neighbourhoods, but the work hasn't been done. And what we're saying here is, let's do this work. So does it in any way slow down or... The attack? Rail Deck Park? Yes. No. But you're saying it, connect, it aligns with it? It aligns with it. And you it want just the work to be done in a parallel fashion? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, these are projects that have been in the books for a long time. There's a lot of community organizations. I mean, parks have been working. We're currently working on the expansion now to Queen Street South. Um, uh, Councillor Palacio has been pushing hard also to move north as well. So the work needs to, to happen. Um, and it just makes sense that as we're planning the Rail Deck Park, as we are in, the, in, the, in conversations with the same organizations, that we talk about these projects as well. We f see the feasibility, we move these forward, because actually people will have access to the Rail Deck Park in a much easier way. Uh, the, the West Toronto Rail Path can feed right into the Rail Deck Park. Okay. right into it. So you can probably cycle all the way from, I don't know, Eglinton or St. Clair, hopefully, uh, and go right into Rail Deck Park without even going on the road for a second. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Palacio, question of the mover? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Bailao and, and Deputy Mayor Bailao is um, the purpose and the intention of this motion. Literally speaking, this is the same motion that you had 
before the executive yes. and before city council yes. back in October 2016. Yes. And somehow there is no much in, within the report. Yep. That's before us. Yep. Yep. So this committee has already approved this motion, but because the work didn't get done, I'm just just for the placing it again. Colleagues in here. Great. Thank thanks you. so much. Thanks, uh, Councillor Palacio. Uh, are there any other questions of the mover? Are there any other speakers? I'm going to say a word or two. Councillor Shiner. We, we will have time to. Well, we, we may not. We're going to adjourn at 12:20. So, Councillor Shiner. All three items. Uh, yes. We're dealing with all three items together. So yes. No problem. So in regards to our parkland strategy and section 42, I think we are moving along. Uh, staff have taken the time to brief me with it. I, I really do encourage you to do the best we can to, to sit with those in the industry and help them help us find ways to make this happen, but also not surprise them yes. with costs that they may have because projects that have been in the pipeline and they have already sold and they can continue to incur additional expenses can be a problem to deliver those projects and we want to make sure that we get good development right across the way. But I think we have to encourage them to understand what we need because some of them do, how our parkland should go out, the reason for the funding, and then get those that understand it to help us encourage the rest to build something together so we can continue to expand and deal with the needs of the city. In regards to Rail Deck Park, it's, uh, it's a wonderful project that was discussed a number of years ago and was actually thrown out by one of the folks in the industry back in 2010 when they unveiled doing a park along this and looked at doing other things within the harbour. And the fact that now it's been taken by council and championed by the mayor to make it move forward is great. Uh, I asked a simple question, cost per acre of land compared to cost per acre to create a park, if you could actually find the land. You can't find the land. You'll never create that much land. So it's an opportunity to create something out of really is a disconnect from the current waterfront. Now you come down to the train tracks and you're stopped. And unless you're going on Spadina or on Bathurst Street, you catch the bridge in the middle, you're stuck and you're not connected. To be able to connect it with a green space of this size and, and this realm, I think, is something that we really do need in the downtown for those that are living there, those that are working there, and those that are going to be moving into it. So um, I am fully supportive of the project. Um, I appreciate the work that the local councillors have done and the staff have done. and. Um, Whatever can be done to keep it moving on, uh, I think uh, all of council should be 110% meritory behind this. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, we have Councillor Palacio and then Councillor Robinson. I'm not. We're not going to be able to get both in, uh, so we'll have to. Uh, what we'll gonna end be, up. I'm going to be one minute. Well, okay. One, well, Councillor Palacio is first, and then then you, and I was going to speak as well. So anyway, you go ahead, Councillor Palacio. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be very brief. I uh, will definitely support uh, Councillor Bailao's motion as well. In principle, I do support creating green space and recreational space uh, wherever is needed, mainly in areas that are gentrifying, like in the downtown or, and, and, or areas that are parkland deficient, and I think that's extremely important for us uh, to do it. Now, there is no question, especially with the rail, uh, with the, um, rail deck park, there is no question about the benefits that will bring. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that will bring citywide benefits overall. And therefore, I think this new park will bring quality of life, health, and sustainability to the city of Toronto. And therefore, I'm in full support of it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I just it would be remiss not to um, highlight uh, the challenges at Young and Eglinton. And I, I do support this initiative. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, as many times as I can, when there's a microphone involved, I want to make sure staff are aware that we have serious um, problems at Young and Eglinton with the lack of green space in public realm. So I do think it's on staff's radar now. Uh, that's the good news. And um, while I do support Rail Deck Park, I love the funding model of Rail Deck Park. It's uh, very impressive. Um, I do hope that we can keep the Young and Eglinton area, which is also under siege from a development perspective, uh, top of mind. Council Robinson, thank you. May I have your concurrence just to extend for two or three minutes past the 12.20 we'd agreed upon, and then I can speak, and I think we can call the question. There's only one motion, I think. All those in favour? Opposed? Carried. May I, may I just say this? Uh, I, 
I really think this boils down to three options that we have. Uh, and, and when I just describe it this way, as I did it at a town hall meeting in Councillor Men and Wong, Deputy Mayor Men and Wong's riding, and I've done it elsewhere yesterday with our staff uh, at Metro Hall in a town hall meeting there. We have the status quo. And the status quo would just leave a rail yard there, uh, which frankly, it wasn't an intended scar on the city. It was a useful and still is a very useful transportation corridor. But if you were looking today and saying, well, would you put a rail corridor there in that way and in that form, of course, I believe you would say absolutely not. But you have the status quo. You could leave it there. It's there. Uh, you have a second option, uh, which, not without oversimplifying, is to say, let's have more condo towers there, maybe some office towers too. Um, and I think if you look at that in any responsible manner and sort of see what has unfolded in terms of the development of the downtown um, and, and uh, where we are with respect to uh, parkland, uh, you'd probably answer that no as well. And then you have the third option that's in front of us, which is uh, an iconic uh, resident magnet. It'll be a business magnet. It'll be a tourist magnet. It'll be a resident magnet from across the city. People will come uh, to this park as a, des as, as a destination. And I think we have to ask ourselves the question of what will the people of Toronto say in the year that's been cited, say in 2041, because that's where some of these population estimates have been, uh, have been projected. And what will they say in 2041 across the rest of the city if we just put up more condo towers there, or if there is still, God forbid, a rail corridor there just looking the way it looks today as many trains as may be passing through there, smart track trains and all kinds of other trains. What will we say to the 475,000 people who will be living downtown by then as to what we didn't do when we had the chance uh, back in uh, 2017, 18, uh, 19? And you know, uh, we have the mechanisms in place. It's been well set out by the speakers and by the presentations uh, to fund this. And we've heard the alternative. It was a very precise and very important question that Councillor Shiner asked, which is, what's it going to cost to go and acquire? And we already know this. We've been out trying to buy uh, 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 little parcels of land here and there that would create small parks, better than none, I guess, but very small parks. And the cost is astronomical. We heard the answer today could be upwards of $100 million an acre. We have a chance here to do something that you don't get very often, which is actually to create some new open space. I mean, you know, I always will say to people when it comes to buying real estate, you can, they're not creating anymore, uh, so therefore the prices will continue to rise based on the law of supply and demand. Well, this actually gives us a chance to create some real estate for a very good public purpose, an important and necessary public purpose. And I think it's before there's even been adequate account taken, and I don't blame the staff. I want to thank them for all their work, but I think this city has huge capacity to attract philanthropic support for this park, which other cities have proven. I've been involved for years before I came to this office raising money, and I know how generous the people are in the city, and confronted with a great project like this, they'll support it. And so I think we owe it to ourselves, but more importantly, we owe it to the people of the city, and we owe it to the generations not even born yet um, to move forward and just continue the work on this. And that's all that's being sought today, is permission to continue the work, and, and, and plus a Councillor Bailao's motion, which I'll support, um, which is to sort of make sure we accompany that with other work we said we would do uh, in tandem. And so I thank you very much uh, for your attention and hope that uh, you'll support this. So I think we are ready to uh, call the question and do that before... Uh, before we have uh, our lunch break. And uh, there's just the one motion from Councillor Bailao. And so we'll call that first. That's a motion to amend the recommendations. And uh, Councillor Palacio has asked for a recorded vote. All those in favor? Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bailao, Councillor Burnside, Councillor Crawford, Councillor McMahon, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Shiner. All those opposed? Motion carries. And the item as amended, a recorded vote. All those in favor? <laughs> Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Bilal, Councillor Burnside, Councillor Crawford, Councillor McMahon, Mayor Tory, Councillor Palacio, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Shiner. Item as amended carries. We will uh, reconvene at 1.30, and uh, I, I urge you and encourage you to go out to, to the square if you have a moment uh, to support our Toronto Argonaut champions. Thank you.